Hey, it's Jeff, and thanks for watching my new A to Z bathroom remodel video. In this video, we're going to teach you everything you need to know so you can change your flooring and your toilet and upgrade your vanity from single to a double. Install an alcove tub in a corner with a half wall with a wall mounted faucet. This is a lap of luxury and it's very affordable. Everybody should upgrade their bathroom to a four piece to have this in it. We're going to go through every step that you need so you can be successful in your bathroom renovation. Unfortunately, we don't have enough room in the file or in the time to put the shower in this as well. So it's going to be a separate A to Z video. It's going to be coming out next week. Okay, we'll put a link in the video description as well in case you're watching this later on. You don't want to miss it because all of these elements together really build and transform a bathroom from something that was functional, kind of, into something that's beautiful and adds value to your home. All right, that's the goal. We don't want to remodel a bathroom just to give it a different look. We want to upgrade its functionality and upgrade its value. That's what we're doing here is teaching you how to do that so that you can make more value in your home. Sit back, grab some popcorn, enjoy this. All right, make sure you ask your questions in the comments section as you go through. We're going to be heavily into the comments this winter when this video is out so that we can help you guys out with all your questions and nuances because not every bathroom is the same. Hopefully this helps you out. Cheers. In this video, guys, I'm going to show you how to install a new floor on top of an existing floor. It doesn't matter what kind of flooring you have or where you're switching over to, whether it's LVT or you're using laminate or you're using engineered hardwood or SPC, it doesn't make a difference. As long as you have any kind of hard surface, the only rule is if you have carpet, you've got to remove it. Other than that, these steps, anybody can transform any room from something nasty like this to something gorgeous like this. Now, just so that you're all aware of what's going on here, I'm doing a complete bathroom remodel. I'm doing seven videos on this, so this is one of the series of that seven. If you want to watch the rest of those videos, check out the video description. You'll get the links to watch this whole series. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you like learning how to do things that make your house worth more money that you can do yourself. Just to make this interesting, I've chosen the most difficult situation in the home, and you'll be able to watch this and go, wow, that wasn't that tricky. I'm using engineered hardwood. It's a floating floor, okay? No fasteners, no adhesives. It just sits by the miracle of gravity. <laughs> now you've got to use the right products and procedures, so we're going to go through that. The reason this is tricky is because this floor is heated. That's right. This is a heated floor, and I've got a system to install floating floor over top of the heated floor that actually works for any kind of surface. Step number one, you're going to want to cut and remove all your baseboards. That's simple. Grab yourself an Olfen knife. If you don't have an Olfen knife, go to the store and buy one or just use our Amazon links in the video description and grab one of these, okay? These are amazing. And what you're doing here is you're cutting the caulking. But even more than that, you're cutting the paper, okay? So that if you, if you tear it, when you're taking off the baseboard, it doesn't go above the knife line, okay? That's what, you're just cutting right through into the paper. One thing you want to make sure you do when you're taking baseboards off is don't increase your scope of work. This is a five inch baseboard. We're going to go back with a five and a half. The idea is if I cut through the paper instead of caulking, I eliminate the risk of the caulking pulling the drywall paper off the surface. I don't have to patch and prime and repair. All right, I just stick the new baseboard on and I'm good to go. I'm going to grab my trusty red bar. All right, see how that works? You're never going to increase your damage. The caulking grabbed the paper here, but only went down because I cut through the drywall. Had I not cut through that drywall paper, it would have peeled all the way up the walls and pulled it off. That just added, would have added hours of work to the day. Step one, done. All right, step two is sweep and scrape. Because you don't know the condition of your house. You might have chunks of mud or cement. It could be just about anything attached to your flooring. So you want to try to create as completely smooth and clean surface as you can and you just kind of go along here like you're raking your yard after the leaves in the fall fall down inspecting every square inch one of the biggest mistakes people make is they don't clean enough before they start and then while they're working they've got to stop and find the tools again and then bend down and scrape again and then they got to get the vacuum to clean it up properly it can really slow you down so really go over the whole work area I'm going to be installing flooring up to here, and then I'm going to transition. I'm going to move the saw to the other side of the room. Here we go. Step three is vacuum. Okay. It's not good enough to sweep. Dirt is your enemy whenever you're doing a flooring job. 
You really want to get into all those nooks and crannies where you remove the baseboard and make sure all that debris is gone. You'd be surprised how much dirt is going to be moving around the room as you're dropping the boards and moving around. So you want to just try to suck it all clean as much as you can before you start laying your flooring. Or you're going to get dirt caught underneath your floor and it's going to make noise every time you walk on it. Here's a quick tip. When you have a big groove like this, okay, and you've got your vacuum up against it, if it's not sucking up the debris, just take a finger on each side and close off the ability for the air to increase the vacuum pressure, and that'll suck up just about anything, okay? Step three is underlayment, all right? Especially with the heated floor, you gotta be careful which underlayment you choose. There's plenty of them on the market. Now, this one is the one that I chose, and believe it or not, I know I'm always giving Home Depot a hard time for the, some of the quality of the products they carry, but this particular product was actually available at Home Depot in the United States. Um, and if you want to know what it is and the benefits of it, it's actually quite simple. I'm going to throw a link in the video description. We're going to do a video specifically on this product and answer on all these questions, okay? But this product here has got a lot of different properties. You're going to want to check that video out to understand is it the right product for you? Because I've given other recommendations in the past about using 3 millimeter EVM, but you can't use that over top of a heated floor. So there's a lot of information in that video. I'm going to suggest you check it out. But with all kinds of hard surface over another floor, I suggest using an underlayment because it makes it quieter as a first, first benefit. And if you buy the right product, you get a lot more value out of the installation than you do by spending a lot more money on high quality flooring. So installing most floating floors are as simple as having a tape measure and a pencil, okay? You really just wanna make sure you follow the next couple of rules. Rule number one, leave a quarter inch gap around the whole room for expansion contraction, all right? Rule number two, uh, make sure that all your finishing trims are going to finish on top of your flooring. So over here, coming out of the bedroom, I actually scribed it earlier so I can slide my first piece underneath, and that is a perfect finish. <sighs> now remember, when you're cutting around things, just marking by eye works really well, but then use a square to draw your lines to cut with. Okay? Okay, now you know. That's the piece I'm cutting out. If you're working with somebody who's helping you and you guys both follow the same process, it's easy to mark and then identify what the cutoff is. So step number five, of course, installing the flooring means you need to have some cutting tools. Depending on the material, you're gonna have a variation. So you could have a chop saw like this, a sliding miter saw, you can have a jigsaw, uh, a lot of the vinyl floors out there, you can cut with a utility knife, but only straight lines. When in doubt, if you're not sure and you don't want to spend a fortune in tools, if you buy one jigsaw, you can cut any kind of hard surface floor, laminate, engineered hardwood, or vinyl, and you can do every single cut with one tool. And this is like about 50 or 60 bucks. course you're going to sacrifice a little bit of quality with your cuts okay and most materials respond the same the solution is we install the baseboard at the end and it'll cover all that damage but if you can get your hands on a saw like this it's much faster work just use a knife to clean out the corners Ready to go. There we go. Almost all of these products install the same. Put in an angle. And then they click lock together. There we go. When you hear that sound, you know you've got it right. Here we are. The product invariably, especially with wood, comes in different sizes. All right, so you're gonna to wanna to sort through it 
make sure that you're being creative with your joints. If you had the same joint every second board all the way through the room, it's going to look very interesting. One of the reasons you use wood is because wood comes in different lengths. So you can take your offcuts, keep them handy, and always use them to finish off the rows. Here we are. It's a good example of just mixing up where the locations are. If you have six inches from one joint to the next, you're always going to be fine and happy with the way it looks. When you're measuring for the remainder, just take the board the direction it's facing, turn it around. Now that's your finished edge that goes right here. Press it up against the wall and then subtract the quarter inch gap that you want. Here we go. Mark and cut it. Save the piece to start another row later on. Or take a few inches off so you can move your, your joint to a different location. I'm going to save this one for later. You can see there's not a lot of skill involved in doing this. The only thing you really got to be concerned about is making sure your joints are staggered. Okay? As long as you're staggering your joints, you're going to be really happy with your end result. Alright, so I'm going to just race through the rest of this room and get this all done. Give this video a thumbs up if you like the idea of learning how to do remodeling projects in your home that you can do yourself with just minimal tools and really increase the value of your property. That is the secret and it's money in the bank. In this video, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know so that you can change your toilet and install a new one even if you're changing the height of your floor. Stay tuned. All right, guys, one of the most important things you need to learn about managing your house is managing the water, specifically with your toilet. There are at least, well, there's at least one toilet for every person living in North America, right? We're toilet crazy. We've got them at home, we've got them at work, we've got them where we eat, we've got them where we play, got them in the park. Bottom line is, there's uh, about a billion toilets <laughs> floating around North America, and on a regular basis, they need to be removed and changed. The sizes change, styles change. You used to have like huge tanks, right? Be enough water in there to fill a swimming pool but now we're getting really low flow and trying to conserve so everybody's updating toilets we're going to go through the process for doing this first thing you got to do is shut off the water supply in the back i am lucky because i have a 90 degree turn shut off valve and then remove these things these things are brutal a lot of times people try to move their toilet and then they want to reinstall it later because they're doing a renovation. And if you don't manage this, it breaks really easily. So you got to put it somewhere safe. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> now that the water's off, you got to empty the sucker. All right? Empty out the back. Now this is called the tank. And this is a one-piece toilet, so we don't have any risk of leakage here. But if it's a two-piece, especially, make sure that you've emptied out the back. And you just check to make sure that the two screws and bolts that are there are tight and nothing's wiggling around, okay? Managing your water here is really the key. If you don't manage the water that's in the toilet when you move it, because it is a pee trap, if you look at an old toilet, you'll see the pipe come down and up, okay? There's a big snake here. And the water actually sits in the bowl all the way down and all the way back up again until it spills over the top to go down to the, through the floor. And so that's the pee trap here, just like underneath the sink. If you leave all that water in there, as you move, it splashes over the top wall, okay? And it ends up all over your floor. So what I got a system here to help you do this so you're not gonna run into trouble. First of all, get a pail of water. Because it's a pea trap, if I pour a large volume of water down at a quick time, it creates a vacuum and it'll suck all the water out of that pea trap almost to the very end. Check this out. So the water level used to be here, now it's down here. So that means that on the back side of that pea trap that's in here, I've got a few inches to play with. That's enough for me to manage. You no need to go grab a vacuum and shove your vacuum in a toilet and get it full of bacteria. God, just do that and then follow the following process. You want to disengage your water supply from your shutoff valve. A couple of turns, it should be just finger tight. Now you're gonna get a dribble here, don't panic. It's just a little bit of water in that hose, okay? Secondly, all toilets have some sort of connection system to the floor. In this case, there's this little cap and a screw, 
And there's something on the floor that's attached to the floor inside the, the back of the toilet that that screws into, okay? There's all kinds of systems out there now. Be careful and pay attention to which one you have. If you have a traditional toilet, it's just going to be the white caps with toilet bolts. You might even need a hacksaw to cut those bolts off depending on the condition of the toilet. This toilet looks to be grouted and silicone to the floor. If you've never seen that before, consider it because the grout offers you a lot of stability and the silicone gives you a great seal. Look at that, there we go. What do you mean it was grouted to the floor? Well, the toilet was installed and then grout was pushed into the groove. Into the, right. And then what it does is it gives it stability so it doesn't rock. It's very common when you're working on uneven surfaces. Mm -hmm. Because instead of using uh, silicone shims, you can just grout it in. Oh yeah. Big deal. Come back the next day, a little bit of silicone, off you go. All right, now she's ready to be released. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna lift this up. Matthew's gonna bag it behind me and they take it out of the way. I like putting something like this straight into a shower pan. Unfortunately today, because we're using lights, we can't get to the shower pan, so we'll set it behind us. The reason for the bag is in case there's any water pouring, dripping out, we keep it contained, okay? Now, uh, we're also gonna get a chance to see the condition of the seal on this toilet. And we'll talk about that and we'll discuss options to so, make this work. Uh, we haven't done this in a little while. Yeah, this one's a difficult one because there's nothing to grab here. You're getting it up in the air. I have I'm nothing to grab here, yeah. So I'm going to grab the back corner and the front edge okay. right here. And I'm just going to wrap it. Okay, ready? All right. I'm trying to lift it up level. There, there we go. go. Okay. And straight down? Yeah. All right. Uh, now, at this point, if you can just get more bag towards the back. Okay, I'm going to wrap it forward. All right, forward a little bit. There we go. Okay, that's good. Now, slide that right over. Easy, 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 in case you... Yeah, okay. Well, that one worked really well. I like that system. So this particular toilet came with a whole flange nut and bolt system. Look at that. Who installed that? Look at that, not even a drip of water, no wax. There's a lot of options out here for doing this kind of work. So what I'm gonna do now is let's take this apart and we'll show you different options. So this is actually a pretty advanced toilet. It's uh, gonna be rather expensive to buy these, about four or 500 bucks. Here's the deal. Traditional toilets don't come with a uh, system like this, okay, for connection. That's where the screws went into. Isn't that amazing? Let's get something back to what it looks like a little bit more traditional. Okay. So this particular toilet comes with installation instructions for this unit right here, and this one sits on the wax. All right? And it's just a really traditional wax ring. But the toilet itself is designed differently. Okay, so here we go. This is all special installation for that particular unit. This is traditionally what you're gonna find. So here is the wax ring that you would buy that I used in this situation, all right? And it is one inch thick. Okay, and it gets compressed and it makes a really good seal. And you can see it is no longer one inch thick. All right. Now, the reason that it fits so well and it didn't leak anywhere is because the height of this flange versus the, the, the tile here. I'm a big believer in the idea of this. The top of your flange needs to be at bare minimum flush with your finished floor or a quarter of an inch higher, anywhere in that range. Okay, now on this particular floor, it has a slight slope. Look at this, almost flush at the back. Okay, full quarter of an inch higher than the floor in the front. All right, and that's why this works. Because I use a regular wax. If it was lower, I would have bought this. Okay, this is the large version of the wax. Same product, one and a half times as thick. Okay, so if you have a toilet that's really flush with the floor, I wouldn't suggest going with the regular wax. Get the jumbo reinforced flange gat wax, okay? Get the jumbo, and that'll help make sure that you get good compression into the wax. Now, let me just go through a couple of things here. 
when you pull this one out of the package, okay, the jumbo wax, there is a possibility that you can screw this up. If you have a good gap here, if you have a nice gap here and you get the jumbo wax, you have the potential of doing something like this. You're gonna go like this, you're gonna drop your wax in place, right? You're gonna line up your bolts, you're gonna go to set the toilet in. If when you go to set the toilet in, you're not all the way where you wanna be, so you're going straight down on it, okay? You're not gonna get good compression. What possibly could happen is you could start here, and then you might start moving backwards, okay? And you get in a position, you think, oh great, I got a good seal. What you've done is you've collapsed your hole, okay? And you end up, I'm just gonna do the demonstration here. I've seen this before many times. We'll get a call from a customer and they're like, this is back in the days when I worked warranty for a renovation company. And I'd open up the toilet and I'd see something like this, all right? Instead of a nice big three inch hole, they got this, all right? That looks like the size of a drain for the sink. You're gonna run into trouble. So you don't wanna be forcing the wax back or sliding it left and right. When you drop your toilet on, you wanna be over top fit, go straight down. If that means you need two or three people to help you, then get them, okay? But you've gotta make sure you go straight down onto your wax to avoid that trouble. All right, garbage. Okay, here we go. So I'm gonna set this aside because I'm gonna use this one later to reinstall this toilet. Let me just go through a couple of other options. You all might have seen this before, and I use this on a toilet in my, uh, a bathroom video, Max, in my, my former house downstairs. Uh, no, yeah. And downstairs we had, um, oh, this, this place, the floor downstairs is over a crawl space, and the crawl space is really short, and it's old school 1880 construction, so the floor has a lot of movement. And so what we did down there to solve our toilet problem is I had a, the toilet flange sitting on the plywood, and then we had flooring, and because of the height of the flooring, I had to add some beef to it. We put in this rubber gasket here, okay, and it goes over the holes. And this rubber gasket replaces the need for wax, okay? So then what happens is the toilet sits on this, and as the house moves and breathes, so does the gasket. See that? So if the toilet is moving around in position all year round with different seasons, the gasket maintains contact with the toilet and you have a good seal. Wax doesn't do that. Once wax is pushed and collapsed, it does not spring back in place. So if you have an older house, or you're on a crawl space and you get weird weather, having a foam gasket like this might be a good solution for you. This was available at Home Depot, if you want to search it out, we'll put the, uh, uh, I'll put a link. I think it might be available on Amazon. Closet flange extension. Okay. And it also comes with a flange extender. Now this ring is going to be for a good for this situation. Here, check this out. We are adding new flooring. Now look what happens. All of a sudden the flange is lower than my finished floor. Okay. You don't want that. Because if I put this on here, with that lower than that, my toilet's not even gonna make contact with that flange, okay? That's a serious problem. Make sure you've always got that at least flush or a quarter inch higher. So what they do is they sell this little extension kit, okay? Boom, boom, boom. Here we go. Now we set this up so your bolts are, when you're looking at it like a clock face, you're at three o'clock and nine o'clock, nice and square and level. Don't go like this, or the toilet might have a potential to, to pop right out of the holes, okay? Now you're high enough. That might even be a little bit too high, okay? But what you wanna do is you wanna screw these four corners right into the existing ABS drain system, okay? So I have ABS drain. You might be on a CPVC. If it's on cast, you can't use this. You can't use this extender on cast, okay? They have a different one, and <laughs> that's a whole new world. Most people in the world were not on cast plumbing anymore. <laughs> because extended toilet bolt kits as well, because when you start building up your toilet kit, you might not have bolts long enough to get above the new toilet when you start stacking all this together, right? So all three of these things work together to get an extension and a seal. Let me get these out of the damn way. Okay, there we go. Extension, seal, and in between this, is a gasket 
under compression and it seals everything, okay? That's why we're screwing it down to create compression. Don't use silicone. I've seen so many plumbers use silicone and throw on a Teflon ring. It's lazy. It's wrong. It always leaks. Anywhere where you have water sitting, silicone will give out. And eventually, because a toilet should sit there for the lifetime of the, of the room. We don't reinstall them every year to get a fresh seal. But if you have any silicone in that assembly, water will get underneath or between that silicone and it'll start working its way out onto your subfloor, rot out your subfloor. And when your subfloor starts to rot around your toilet, all your screws are in rotting wood. And so the wood swells and then everything starts to get loose and then your toilet starts to wiggle. And as your toilet wiggles, the wax starts to open up worse and worse and worse. Next thing you know, the wax is broken, the water's all around the toilet. <laughs> this is what happens. It can take five or 10 years. But so don't let somebody install a toilet incorrectly in your house because the warranty they're gonna give you on that installation is 30 days to a year tops, right? But the damage they can cause by doing it wrong will bite you in the butt. Years down the road, you'll be sitting there going, geez, honey, there's a really weird dark stain on the ceiling. What's up with that? Somebody use silicone on your toilet. All right, now the next option is this product here. Okay, it's very similar. Now, this one comes, this one has two different thicknesses and rings. Okay, so this is my go-to. Anytime that I know I need an extension, but I'm not sure how big it's gonna be because I haven't pulled the toilet off yet, I buy one of these, okay? There's two gaskets that come with it. There's an adhesive backing on it, okay? The adhesive backing is to apply to the underside of the ring. I'm gonna set that up, bam, all right? Now you're ready to go. Extension, all right? Now the reason I like this particular system so like I said, it's got the screws, so I can screw in four corners. The other thing it has is, this bolt system doesn't allow it to slide out, okay? So you can put these in the right location, and then you stack it like this, and then you would screw it in, okay? Now, when you're gonna go install your toilet, they have these clips. Check this out. Little plastic washers. It's kinda like a zip tie. And you can get your bolt standing straight up by using that zip tie. Remember what I said about setting your toilet straight down? If you use this system here, you can line this up perfectly. And as an individual, you can set that on. If you don't have those, these bolts can be all over the place, making contact with the toilet, and then you gotta lean and slide and try to, you need two people. But with this, it's a one person installation. Very common out there is the existing floor. If you're adding tile, then you know you have to get one and a quarter inch thick on your subfloor. So what we do is we don't move the flange, we add the plywood around it. We got a great video that we added the subfloor. Okay, if you're doing a project like that and you need to add subfloor thickness, we'll put a video link in the description. Or you can check the card if you get cards in your notification. The other thing is, when you go that thick on your tile, we take the, the seal. Okay, boom. Double stack this bad boy. Okay? Good to go. Now when you do your screws, you screw through here. They're, they're already lined up. Boom, boom, boom. All the way down into the ABS. Now you've got enough height difference here to add plywood and tile and still have a little bit sitting above your floor, okay? Guaranteed every time. If you're doing a tile job and you're going from um, just regular subfloor because you had a vinyl sheet floor, Go back to the original 5 8s, get that little quarter inch plywood out of there, grab one of these kits and double stack it, all right? And then you can install your toilet knowing that you're gonna have a great seal. And depending on the thickness, like I said, you can go with the regular wax if you are a little bit above your floor when you're finished, or you can go with the large wax when you're done, all right? One more thing. When you're doing your toilet day, make sure you pop by your local coffee shop, grab yourself a copy. These are like wax lined cups. Perfect every time. That'll stop the sewer gas from coming into the house while you're working. This information is really good for anybody who has CPVC or, or ABS plumbing, all right? Um, if you have cast, you can actually buy brass rings. If Sometimes the cast, you still have lead. The lead is a soft metal that's sticking up and you can actually just take a torch to it really lightly and then you can hammer it flat, okay? I know it's crazy. 
and then you can put your adhesive right over top of that and then bolt your toilet to the floor. There's a few other varying situations, but they also make a, uh, a flange insert that goes into that pipe and it's called twist and seal, all right? It's a white PVC, has a big three inch black gasket on it and the sides are tapered. The idea is you set it in place and you start spinning it. And the, the contact that the, the gasket has with the side of the pipe slowly starts to get compressed tighter and tighter and tighter as you thread it down. So if you have an old pipe and you don't have a flange and you've got nothing to attach to, that twist and seal will save your bacon. Okay, so it is on the market. All of these things are available at your local building store. You don't have to go to a specialty supply store for this. That's the best part. When in doubt, if you have an issue, take a picture of what you're, you're dealing with, get a measurement of whatever your finish is from your floor, know your flooring assembly you're gonna be using, you can go to the hardware store and they'll help you get the right stuff, okay? They're at least competent enough to help you with that. Most plumbing departments at these stores, you've got someone who has enough competence to help you with your toys. <sighs> and if you have other questions and you just can't seem to solve your problem, consider becoming a member on our channel. We've got a forum, you can send pictures and ask questions there and we can help you out ourselves, okay? So in summary, let's just go through the, the major points here. One, don't ever use silicone. If you have to rely on silicone to seal your water, you're just delaying the damage that's inevitable. Number two, try to get flush to a quarter inch up. Okay, if you're a quarter inch high, it's perfect. Regular wax is good. If you need to build it up, use a system that's designed for building it up. Don't get creative in your home and experiment. All right, and number three, always install your toilet straight down when you're finished and you'll be just fine. Remember, one of the most common causes of water damage in the home is a leaking toilet. It's unbelievable. I've probably replaced in 500 toilets in my career. <laughs> and I'll tell you right now, about 430 of them were installed wrong. So if you're watching this video, chances are yours is too. The way you can tell is if it moves side to side or front to back, you got a 95% chance that there's a leak going on right now. You might want to take it up and have a good look, okay? If you like that information and you think it saved your bacon, give this video a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel because we are in the middle of a massive bathroom remodel project. We're doing everything bought from the local building store so that you guys can do this project at home on your own, okay? It's going to be totally doable. Yes, you can remodel your bathroom and you can make a ton of money doing it. So now that we've got our flooring installed, let's take a look at the actual implementation of the solution here. We'll start off by going with a thick ring. Now, you're gonna see that maybe that's allowable on the back because I have a sloped floor and a level fixture. Um, I'm way too thick at the front. So that's not gonna be acceptable. Remember, this is gonna be sitting on the floor. So. I can't have something that's causing this to be sitting too high off the ground, or that's just gonna be a serious problem for me. Here we go. This is the thinner piece. Okay, I'm just above flush here, maybe an eighth, and I'm a quarter in front. I like that. We're gonna go with it. You know, it's funny because, you know, most toilets don't have an elaborate system like this. And this has an integrated rubber gasket here that the toilet actually is gonna stretch and have its own self seal. And I'm using wax to seal this to my, my flange. Majority of toilet, toilets that are on the market today are basically, they're cheap. They don't have, you know, expensive flange options. There's a lot of different companies out there who sell four, six, eight hundred dollar toilets and they have really complex systems to manage the fact that it'll never leak. But the average person is getting a builder grade toilet or they're going to a box store to find a toilet to replace what they have now and they just don't sell quality there. So you have to contend with the fact that your installation has to be bloody perfect to protect yourself. You, there's just no mercy for you. <laughs> wow, that'd be nice if they weren't quite so aggressive. If when you put your flange on and you're over gaps or screws and you can't use the pre-drilled holes, don't worry about it, all right? Just reposition. I know this ain't sexy, but it's gonna get done. Okay. Yeah, just because it works doesn't mean it's easy, eh? All right, now this is just nasty. 
we're dealing with these wax rings. If you want, you can wear latex gloves if you can get a, even find them. Due to COVID, it's hard to get a hold of products like that at the hardware store nowadays. So, wear some clothes that you can rub your hands on and get rid of the wax. All right. Now that's in position. Next couple of steps have got to happen pretty darn quick here. All right. We do not want to be smelling our sewer system. Thank you, Timmy's, for your help. Hmm. It's just wax. But you don't want to have too much buildup on the inside to make your hole smaller, right? All right, now here we go. amazing, eh? Now with most conventional toilets, all you do is you put the wax down, attach your screws, and drop your toilet right over top. With this system, I have to go grab a wrench now, but I gotta install this coupling. I gotta install this system over top and then tighten my screws. So you can see that the nut sits on top of these brass washers. When the washers start to bend, you're putting more pressure on that toilet than you need to, okay? That's your key, you don't know when to stop. If you wanna know how much pressure, as soon as this nut starts to bend that washer and so it's folding into the hole, just stop, you've got enough pressure. You're not doing any more favor to yourself by going any tighter. All right, well, now I'm just gonna drop the toilet in place and connect the water supply again. Cutting the bolts down because I don't wanna have any interruption with setting that new one on top. This particular toilet. What's that for? That's where this goes. Okay. That's where the screw, the screw to set this in goes. So when you're gonna go set the toilet down, put the hole right in the middle of that tape, and then set it down. I'll bend to the left. You go to the right. <laughs> I know it seems silly, but straight over. Okay, I'm good. Me too. There you go. Right it just middle. sits right in place. Put our little decorative cap on there. That looks pretty. Connect our water supply. <clears throat> Shut off valves. Always start with finger tight. And when it gets stiff, you know you've made contact with the gasket that's in there, okay? Then you can take a pliers, give it another full turn, maybe a full turn and a half. Really gets good compression, okay? Check for leaks, we're good. And remember, whenever you're doing a remodeling project and you're adding new flooring, if your plumbing is coming through the floor, you don't have to cut it off and put on a new shutoff valve. Just work your flooring around that hole. Get yourself one of these. This is called a split pipe flange, okay? This will cover up the pipe and just snaps in place and you just set it there. Good to go. Perfect every time. Here we go, guys. Now listen, very careful when you put the... <laughs> you don't wanna, at the last moment when you have a full tank of water, crack the darn tank. In this video today, guys, we are going to renovate or well, remodel this tub area, and we're going to take it from this to this. I know it's not much to look at right now, but the tub is actually a fantastic jetted tub. We're just going to peel off all the trims, get some proper substrate in behind it, get some tile on the walls, and then we're also going to remove this here and build a new half wall. I'm going to have the um, tub faucet for this coming out of the wall. It's a beautiful new fixture. We'll show you all about that later and how to install it. We'll do the plumbing and everything. But right now, what I gotta do is peel this onion apart and find out right back to the original uh, integrated tile flange of the tub so then I can rebuild properly, all right? I've already got the water off downstairs, so we're gonna open up the line, and all we're gonna get is air. So there's a little bit of water coming out of the line, but generally I'm just allowing air in here. I opened up a faucet on the main floor, so now the lines are all busy being drained. That's what we want because we're gonna get this removed off the floor too. So while that's draining, we're gonna just peel this open. Looks like just Brad Nails knows adhesives. That's great news for me. Oh yes. Love trusting in silicones and sealants. You know, if they're sitting in water, they never hold. 
This is the problem with most of the showers and tub systems in the world today. 95% of the systems that are out there that they're selling you require silicone to be the waterproofing. And it never, never holds. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know you're going to have a temporary shower if you buy something that needs silicone to keep it from getting wet. Let's see how much mold we're going to get back here. Not bad. Wow. That's surprising, actually. Let's have a look at this now. Should just lift out and lay down. I'm not sure how in the hell, I can't remember how I did that. I must have had a hole open from the ceiling down beneath. Okay, well, it looks like I'm gonna cut a hole in the ceiling then. Uh, what to do, what to do, what to do. Like, there we go. Okay, it was just wedged in. And that is what I need. Right there. Okay, now I can cut that line and cap them. And then it'll be a little freer to work around here. Down getting plumbing materials. I figured I might as well get enough supplies to sink a ship. Uh, maybe we'll get lucky and be able to reroute it right up into this wall cavity while we're at it. Now, this is one of these situations you want to have paper towels with you. If we can avoid having to cut open the ceiling downstairs, that'll save me another four or five hours worth of work. <laughs> so we're going to just be slow and gentle here. There's two things we have to avoid. If that line drops out below, beneath the floor here, then I'm not going to be able to uh, have access to it. All right, this weighs a couple of pounds. All right. That ought to keep it where it is. We'll get the copper ring on it, if we can. All right, so even if that falls down now, it's not gonna be a problem. Okay. Whew, ah, ah, step one. All right, well, at least we can put it, finish the flooring now. Now I've gotta figure out if I have enough flexibility to get enough of that line into this cavity. Well, this is gonna get messy, I'm taking my watch off. All right, so here's the plan. Yeah, I need to be able to reach in and hold the pipe, cut it, and then cap it with my thumb right away, drop the cutters, and then pull the old line out so they don't get water everywhere because there's water sitting in that line. From here, it goes down and then back up. So that's like a P-trap for water now. I don't want that water going into anywhere else. Yeah, we are gonna have water, ladies and gentlemen. There's just no way around it. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna create a spill catcher. And I'm gonna lay this on this drywall for the ceiling. These absorbent towels ought to catch whatever drippy mess I make. I'm gonna get that in here. Even if the drywall gets a little wet, it'll still dry. It's just not enough room in here for two hands. Okay. Okay. I got most of it. Yeah, I'll be able to put an elbow on that and crimp it. Okay. Now this cutter, it's starting to get old. It's being dinged up, dinged up in my toolbox too much. So it doesn't cut very nice without crushing the pipe. Which is why I'm having trouble. Now, you know I should answer this question while I'm here. I get this question a lot about um, these rings versus the pinch clamps. So this system was out a long time ago, all right? And basically it's just a ring and, and the, there's a tool that pinches this. They work great if it's pinched properly, okay? And if it fails, it's gonna fail right away. So you gotta pressurize your lines before you move forward because you just don't know. There's, um, it's an overlap system right here. So the bridge, so it's, 
if it doesn't pinch right and, and, it, and it comes off this little nub here that's sticking through, it's just, it'll blow right off. That's why I like the solid rings. The solid rings never fail unless you forget to crimp them. So if you're doing plumbing in your own home and you want to know which system is better, solid rings by a mile. It used to be that these tools are $100, $150, but now you can get them for $30. Bucks. Two more, and we'll get on with the demo knowing our plumbing is taken care of. We're going to just put our caps in here. Cool thing about these caps, you see the tabs on the side? It's like a depth stopper, okay? So you can bring, bring the ring right up to make contact with it. Where's he going? Here we go. Here we go. That's where you install it. That pushed all the way down and lifted up to contact. Perfect every time. You don't even have to think about it, okay? And it's the same gap for every other crimp that you're going to do. About a quarter inch from the end of the pipe. All right? Okay, so this is all silicone. This is grabbing the dirt, all right? Make sure your blade is nice and clean. You got to remove it. Um, new silicone will not bond to old silicone. Got to always remove it. And not just the bulk of it. I mean, if there's a skim, that thin little layer here, that's all it takes for there not to be a bond, okay? It's got to come off. And then even at that, there's still a little bit of something there, right? Now they make silicone removers and you paint them on and you brush them on and then you let it sit there for a while and you can rub it off. But if you've got a ton of silicone sitting there, it'll take you weeks to do that process. So get a good blade, get it nice and make sure it's sharp, make sure it's flat, okay? Make sure you're nice and low and get underneath all that old stuff. In a lot of cases like this, when I'm doing a, re a resurfacing and I'm changing the silicone out, I'm also having the tub glazed again. So I'm not concerned about if I put a little hair scratch in it or something, right? And I'm also taking it off where I'm planning on putting silicone again. So even the smallest scratches are going to get covered by the new bead of silicone. Yes, yeah, the same process, same glazing, no matter what kind of tub you have. Steel, acrylic, porcelain, doesn't matter. It'll be good. So once we're done all the tile, if you want to do a, a reglazing program, call up the lo local reglazing, okay, or tub glazing people. And they'll just tell you over the phone and say, just don't put any silicone on until after we've glazed. Okay, because whatever they're using bonds to old silicone residue. Okay, and then you're going to have a new surface and then you can, you can uh, cock all of your tub to the tile. Right, so just do it in the right order. You'll be just fine. This is a great tool. I think it's a Husky brand, isn't it? Yeah, it's a brad nail remover. When you're doing a demolition, the best time to remove nails is right away. Okay, don't leave it. And be really thorough. If you leave one nail, and inevitably someone comes along to do mud or caulking and hits a nail, it can damage your tool, it can slice your fingers open. So make sure you have your electrical tape handy. Not easy, but it'll be possible. All right, well, here's a solution to our problems. Uh, Cardi board, right? Half inch, it's the same thickness as your drywall. Uh, I'm gonna put it on the back, down the side, all across the front. I'm gonna replace this, and I'm gonna take the first four inches of drywall out of here and I'm going to install the Schluter Curdy board all along the back side as well. Okay? And then when I build this frame, we'll wrap that in Curdy board as well. It's nice and simple. Um, I'm probably going to waterproof the board to the tub surface. We'll have to show you that in just a few minutes. We're going to want to definitely waterproof with the Curdy tape to the tub surface. Okay? If I use the Curdy tape, to about maybe half an inch on the tub surface and then up. Then I'll be able to have a waterproof seal to the tub and avoid water sitting underneath that gap. And I think that's what I'm gonna to have to do. The other solution is I'm going to take the Curdy Fix um, or the sealant bond, because it's easier to get a hold of, okay? Up here in Canada, we have Lepage sealant bond. Down in the States, you guys have the Loctite Corporation and they make all the same stuff. So they have a Loctite sealant bond product. And you can actually throw a thick bead, okay, and then set the board in the bead. Problem solved. You fill that gap with something that's going to seal it up forever and it'll be waterproof. Then that, that's a lot easier and probably a lot more cost effective than buying a roll of tape. 
so now I have a plan. I got to go shopping. I need a little bit more of this board. Wasn't sure what was going to be found here, but this is just a thin plywood. Okay, so this particular tub comes with these wooden blocks already in an adhesive attached to the tub, and it's, it's got a quarter inch gap. So it's great for facade. You put a quarter inch plywood on there or something, and you paint it in, trim it up like I did. Um, because that's not doing anything to help. Okay, this board was installed to be the back at the same depth as this. So I'm going to just save that and then we'll move on. All right, well, now it's time for me to prep for my tile. And in order to do that, I want to get rid of this drywall surface because of the fact that this could hold water. And I'm not going to get rid of a lot. I'm just going to cut out like about four inches or something. And I'm going to replace it with the Schluter board um, or the den shield that I just bought because I went to the store to get enough Schluter board and they were out of stock. Loving it. So I picked up den shield because in a tub environment, I don't need to worry about having a waterproofing system. I just need to make sure that I have a good quality tile backer that isn't going to be deteriorated if it gets, you know, in contact with some water, which will be temporary. So den shield is a perfect solution for that situation. It's a fiberglass based board. Don't recommend it in showers personally, but that's because it requires silicone in order to have good joints. Or you're using Schluter Curdy membrane. If you're going to go through all that hassle, you might as well just buy the Curdy board right out of the gate because it's the same price as those two products put together. And a hell of a lot easier to work with if you can get your hands on it. So <laughs> here we are today being creative and bobbing and weaving with the COVID supply chain issue. This is my tile. You might have seen this before. We're using it in the bathroom, in the shower. And we're going to just bring it over here because it's going to look lovely. Now what I want to do, I'm just going to walk through my process from the way my brain thinks. So it's a little scary. You can see that this is the leftover of that other wall that was here. But I'm putting in a 2x6 wall here. And that only comes to this point. 2x6 plus the, the den shield plus the tile is going to come down and cover my floor, I'm really hoping. So I just dropped a laser level on the edge of the tub and I'm going to find out where my six and a half comes to here. Like really just to the edge of my flooring. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build my two by six box and I'm going to shim and then attach the tub to the box with the added part of a shim. And that'll give me an extra eighth to three sixteenths and that'll give me positive contact on there. Okay. It's not a real big deal, just going to be a little bit creative and that will be fine. So basically what I'm doing is I'm going to put a, a leg here, a leg there, something like a 2x4 across on the bottom just to give it some stability, uh, a 2x6 across here so that I can attach my tub to the structure and that leaves nothing but space so that when my plumbing comes tomorrow then I can put in a proper backer piece and all that sort of stuff, okay? Now, the other challenge here, of course, is the floor has a slope. So I need to use a laser level to draw my line to build my box. <sighs> Remember, just because, just because your floor is not level doesn't mean you want to build everything else not level, okay? Your, your counter's level, the tub is level, I want the box level, the tile should be level. And you want to have a finished spot and then everything grow to meet, make contact with the floor. So I want to just take a measurement here and we're going to just remind us that this is 11 and 5 eighths. Now let's do some tub math. 11 and 5 eighths. Okay. Now right here, I'm also going to want to leave room. I want to build in a gap of about, a, about an eighth of an inch that I can silicone the finish. Okay. So I got an eighth there. I'm going to use a 1 eighth grout line there. All right. And that is good. So that's Grout line, grout line, tile, and what I want to do is I want to build this two tiles tall. So we'll do that again, all right? So that's 22 and 10, 11, 12 eighths. Which is 23 and 4 eighths or a half. That's the height of the finished tile off my deck, all right? So what I'm going to do. So I'm just going to mark that right here, 23 and a half. This is where the science gets really crazy. 
if that's where my tile finishes, okay, then I want my box here to be built so that the tile that's on top of the box finishes at this height as well. All right? I know that sounds a little bit wonky, but that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to drop my laser level on this line right here so I can measure at this point and measure at this point to that line in space to create the perfect height box so that when I'm done, I can take my wood dimension, add my tile backer and my tile to have this tile line come all the way across. A <sighs> little preparation goes a long way in this environment. And you also can cheat a little bit and take a hair off, okay? We have the ability to um, modify the finished height because I'm going to put the back on. I'm going to put the top on and then I'm going to build down the sides, right? Because I need this grout line to come across and then whatever the gap is is what I'm going to use. What I'll do is I'll do first tile, second tile, full tile. We're going to cap this surface with the plastic edging and this surface with the plastic edging and then push the other tile up to the plastic edging so that it's consistent. Boom, boom, boom. Are you a superhero? That one is 40 and 5 eighths. Is our total height. And then over here, 41 and 7 sixteenths. Uh, at least the bottom will look good. <laughs> like, we'll have full tile, full tile, full tile, and then like, you know, a half tile or something on the bottom, that'll be fine. You see how this is built out past the tub? I'm going to do the same thing with the other box. I'm going to build it to the end and then add another piece to get over top of the hardwood. Good. Now I can take a measurement because the outside wall is going to be sloped too, so 34... 34 and a quarter, we'll call it. All right, so just to summarize, because our wall isn't level or plumb and our floor isn't level, you have to find an imaginary point out here. And then this becomes your square. All right, that's why I use a laser line because I can draw a line off the existing and then I can use that as a mark and then I can draw another line and I can create an, an imaginary square point out here. Okay, that's what I'm doing. You got to think backwards because this has to be plumb and give the illusion that everything is square and level. So if this point in your imaginary point here is out, you're done. You can't even start. That's why we drew a line here so that the tile comes across. That's why this is set to this height. And then that's why we brought it out with a laser line across the front just to give everything the perfect illusion. And then with that using that point, I can measure back in every other direction. Okay? So if you can just imagine it, it's almost like somebody was standing here going, here's your spot, there's the outside corner. And then you can have somebody else measure from that corner in every direction. It's the same idea. But because I'm standing here alone, I'm using laser level. All right, hopefully that helps. <laughs> now I got my cut list. Let me go run my lumber and uh, we'll screw this together with some decking screws and mount the tub and get everything square and level. Yay! Woohoo! Um, so off camera, I just uh, made an adjustment because the outside wall is tilted out. When I screwed it together, it screwed it wanting to stick this way. So what I did is I took out the middle piece and I cut a two degree angle on this from here on this angle here. All right, and then I attached that to this board first. And then over on this end, I simply just raised it up. And as I raised it, the, sh the structure started to shift. So I found a sweet spot. It's almost an inch higher on this side. And that's what caused it to lean. So now it's installed. It's perfect. Let's see if this looks decent. Ooh, that's close. I feel like I got my measurement wrong here. I'll just tie a hair. There's an easy solution to that problem. One of the benefits of building with screws is if something's screwed up, you can fix it. You know, I was working with an imaginary corner after all, right? There, that's close enough to fix with the tile. Now we're square. Like it's important because when you walk in a room, your line of sight, you're going to see this line, you're going to judge it based on the window trim. And these types of things, 
you know, make sure you just take that extra moment and double check. If you got to make a repair, make it. You're building with screws. It means you can take it apart and do it again. This isn't Ikea furniture. If you take a screw out, <laughs> the wall panel doesn't disintegrate. It's just lumber, right? So let's just make sure we do that right. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to attach my tub to this cross section here. So I'm going to add a quarter inch to my distance. Always pre-drill this hole. This is fiberglass. It's not going to stretch for you and it's not going to secure anything long term unless you put a screw through a hole. And once I've got this in, I'll be able to move the base until it's level this direction, or plum, sorry. God, why is it as a Canadian I'm always saying level instead of plum? Or is it just me because I'm from Cambridge? <laughs> nice. Now we've got a situation where everything is attached. I've got structure to the tub again. I got my hot and cold, lots of flexibility here to hook up the tub. And I got a nice deep cavity so that when I have my tub spout sitting here, the shower, there's like a wand shower extension that actually mounts inside the housing and the, um, the hose is inside the interior of the wall. So that's why I just kind of went with a simple box and I left lots of room for that hose to dangle. Don't want to get it caught inside there later. I'm feeling good. Okay, and like most of the times when I'm working out of the top of my head, I make changes as I go, which is good because it's good to know how to make changes. Um, here's my rough-in fitting for my faucet for the tub. It, uh, it weighs about six or seven pounds, solid brass. So if you want to know where to buy quality like this and not plastic, then uh, we'll put the information in the video description, okay? What I'm going to do is my back is going to be two tiles tall. We already established that. But I'm not a big fan of how tall this is relative to the counter. And I don't need the extra privacy. And I don't need the extra space either because this is going to be easy to connect. The fittings are going to go here. My lines will connect. And I can mount this as low as or high as I want. So I'm actually going to make this section one tile high. Because I don't want to make the room feel claustrophobic. So here's my tile. Here's my line. That's my cutting point. Now. The only thing you need to know now is that if that's where my finish is, that needs to be the finish after my den shield, right? So I gotta take a half an inch off. Okay. And make it a healthy half an inch for Pete's sake. You can always pack on a little bit extra mud because when I'm tiling this, I'll tile all the walls first and then I'll put the cap on last with the edging, all right? That makes it so much easier to do then that way I've got the ability to add the extra cement if I need it in order to create that buildup. But the tile will finish at this line. The cut here, add the dent shield, tile on top. I'm ready to go. So now, now it's time to set the blade. There we go. Now I'm gonna resize it and get moving forward. All right guys, when you're gonna install the plumbing fixtures, you always get paperwork. Now the information that you really wanna know here is a, the center of this fixture matches up with the center of the tub. That's what that C is down here, okay? And then this is the tub surface, and they recommend seven inches from the deck, all right? That's easy enough to do. And then here's your depth setting. You see here there's a, a, a finished wall. That means after you're done the tile. So this measurement here, this thickness, is lumber plus den shield plus tile. All right, don't get confused with that. And the maximum depth from the finish to the back is three and, is, uh, three and seven eighths, or three inch. And the minimum is two and a quarter. So what I'm gonna do is take those two numbers now. Mm. So my minimum is one and a quarter for my back plate. Because I get an, another inch of den shield and tile. Okay, so I'm gonna me measure it off inch and a quarter. That's my minimum. That's as close as I can be forward, which makes this stick out as far as it'll allow me. And I don't like that because I have zero mercy now. So 
I'm going to move it back a little bit more, okay, and I was up to three, so I can go to two inch. Now look at this here, this zone. This is the safety zone for the install. If it's back too far, then the handle assembly is going to not go on properly. It might run into rubbing and grinding issues. So when I'm installing, what I want to do is I want to measure my bracing right in the middle. That's my safety zone, okay? So I'm going to put in a horizontal piece now. It's at that point here. It's just a little bit behind this plate. Now, the trouble with my situation more than I'm dealing with is I don't have the plumbing cut yet. Well, that's fine. I'll just leave it out of the way. I'll cut that later. Let's get that horizontal piece in first. And on the other side, it's, and the good thing here is it's just about a quarter inch behind this, right? So I know it's right about there is where I want to go. And my two by six goes something like this, okay? Perfect. That's just so that that end doesn't fall down while I'm screwing this in. I'm just going to use this caulking line as my line and replace drywall with den shield. Because it's just a tub, I just want to make sure that this area here, if there's any water setting, it's not soaking it up into the wall from behind. So I'm being a little paranoid, but... This is a great time to be a little paranoid. Now, you remember in another video, I was talking about I was going to review these black blades. I don't know. I mean, they work great. I just don't know if they're <laughs> worth paying extra money. They seem to do the same thing the other ones do, as far as I'm concerned. There it is. Easiest way to describe this, it's made by a drywall company but it's made out of fiberglass, okay? So if you think fiberglass pink or fiberglass yellow from 40, 50 years ago was hard to work with, this is nasty, all right? Do not use any kind of power tool to cut with this, okay? That, that'll get in your lungs so fast and you'll have to go to the hospital. It'll drive you crazy. But if you're careful handling it and you cut it and you install it and then you just go and wash your hands and arms under cold water, you're gonna be fine. So just a warning there, I hate to see somebody something stupid and get sick. They're new from corner to the middle and then from middle to the other side here just so that we have something to screw it to, okay? You can scratch the front and then break it just like commercial drywall. What makes it commercial, the 5.8 stuff and fire rated is it's got the glass fiber in it. Well, this is the same kind of thing, only it's just, it's like glass fiber on steroids, right? I mean, it's just crazy. And here we go. As little dust as possible. That's it. You don't even have to cut the back side, right? I'm gonna make sure I got a factory edge down and I'm gonna set it in my adhesive when I install this. We've gotta have a tile backer because we don't wanna have our, any of our a tile actually attached to wood, right? Expansion, contraction, you've gotta have something that you can tile on. This is a guaranteed tile backer system. It resists absorbing moisture. If you leave it outside for weeks in the rain, it's still relatively dry. You know, we take it inside for an hour or two and it's good to go. It is guaranteed as a tile backer for life, residential installation. And if you have ever seen the yellow panel on the outside of commercial buildings, this is what they're using. This is their weatherproofing system for us up here. Okay, they just stick all this stuff, cover the whole outside of the house. There's no building material on the outdoor, on outside of commercial anymore that absorbs the moisture. So you got this outside of rock wool. It's a great little system, right? Nothing's soaking up the water, and then you've got steel stud. So generally speaking, any water that gets past the facade really has nothing to cling to. It just drains to the bottom and runs out. All right, now I need my caulking gun. Here we go. Seal and bond, okay? Um, this is in Canada. Down in the States, it'll say Loctite. All right, pretty sure they're the same company, but some of these products have to have different names in different countries. I'm not exactly sure what the rules or regs are for all that, but... Okay, now we're going to just set a nice thick bead here, all right? There's no better seal than just not having a gap available, right? Walk right up to it. Now, 
we are going to absolutely fill this space here with sealant bond, which is going to absolutely waterproof this joint. Okay, so that no water that comes on the tub edge is going to have anywhere to pool. So then after we put our tile in, we can finish with silicone and we're going to be just fine. Just going to tool it in with another piece of leftover. Acrylic tubs, you can't really get a good bond with silicone. Right? Um, and in this situation, because my tub goes down, if I don't fill that space, water's going to sit there. And whatever silicone I have on the surface is going to be rendered useless. I miss that all together. You can't, you can't have water sitting in the silicone. It lifts it up and it goes right behind anyway. It's like as if it was never there. This stuff is nasty to work with, but it works, right? Like that, that really does work. I know you're gonna be looking at that going, wow, that is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and you're probably right. But the point is, is I can't have the water sitting there. Because no matter what I use, if the water gets in behind and sits there, it's going to fail. This will at least give whatever silicone I have a fighting chance because it's going to keep the water out. All right, well, let's get the rest of this tub covered and we can get it tiled. Um, of course, we're going to show the plumbing installation in just a minute. And then I'll show you the finishing touches because I have to have a trap door at the end here as well because it's a, a, a jetted tub. So you have to have access to the motor. So the last panel that goes on over here, we're going to show you how to get that mounted so that you can have that removable. And then other than that, you know, we'll put on the finishing trims and get this sucker all cleaned up. We'll be good to go. This product, I chose Rebel Pro. And if you're not sure where to find this product, I'll put a link in the video description. But it has a tub spout. It has a removable shower wand so you can rinse down your tub. And then it has a, a handle that's a thermostatic valve so you can adjust and preset your temperatures. Okay, all you gotta do is turn it on and you always get the same heat in the tub as you're used to. So it's really simple. You don't have to guess and add water and add cold, add hot. You just set it the way you want it, set it and forget it, right? It's really sleek. This is the, the plate, okay, that goes on the wall. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that, right? That's gonna be just so sexy. Okay, let's get this going. Got all the functionality here. I got this and Here's the Riobel Pro thermostatic valve system. This is where you go to open this up or close it. Okay, nice and simple. <clears throat> what we want to do today is we want to get this mounted right here with this on the center line. Okay, and then in order to do that, I've got to make some room for my water lines right here. And I'm just going to use my sawzall instead of setting this up. I bent my water lines out of the way, so I'm not going to run into issues, and I'm going to just be aggressive and get it done. My battery's already dead, probably. Not a big surprise, I got one on the charger, I'll be right back. It's a funny thing about older tools, or sorry, older batteries, because this is a brand new tool. It was an older battery, and it just doesn't have the same oomph anymore. So if you find your tools just underwhelming you, don't throw out the tool. Go get new batteries. You'd be surprised how much more life you can put into your tool. I'm going to move that. It's going to vibrate off and kill me. Yeah, that's close enough. Okay. All right. I just wish that these came packs ready. But, you know, there's only so much demand for this kind of product. They make it copper ready or whatever. Disappointing. Okay, now let's focus on this. This is a half inch NPT thread and that's half inch PEX ready. <sighs> Since the beginning of um, water supply in the history of North America, we've been using half inch NPT thread. First on steel and galvanized pipes and now it's in brass and copper. Brand new fittings are still using the same thread size as plumbing that's in your house that's 140 years old. So, feel free to never have to be wondering what that fitting is gonna be. It's always the same darn thing. All you need to know is if it's a male thread, like this fitting, 
or the female thread. And you can do as much piping like this as you want to, but you're going to want to use the Teflon tape. And you hold it with your thumb and you stretch it around the threads. Okay? And there's a lot of thought and conjecture on this, but bottom line is you put it on the same direction counter, sorry, you put it on contrary to the direction that you thread it in so it stays wrapped tight. Otherwise, I don't know if this is going to happen, but it'll all come loose. You see when you're putting it in? And then you don't have waterproofing. Here we go. Now, nice and tight. Okay, because once this is in the wall, you don't get a chance to go and torque it again to fix it without taking your tile off. So it's important when you're done this, have your shutoff valve horizontal so it's closed. All right, turn the water back on, pressure test it, let it sit. Four, six hours overnight is even better because if it develops just a drip of water, depending where you are, like I'm on a really high quality water softener system, I don't have any um, contaminants, zero parts per million in my water. So it won't self seal, you know, with all the little crud that's in the line. If you're on city water and you don't have a filter, even a small drip will end up sealing itself. Now, there's no rule as to how tight to put this on. But I will tell you this. If you've got anything left in here, use it, okay? That's the only guarantee you got that it won't leak. Remember, most of these threads and fittings uh, have at least one component coming from an international supplier that may not have the highest quality standard of manufacturing. So you don't really know what you're buying, right? I know that my, my fitting here is actually manufactured in Quebec, so I don't have a problem. That's Canada, folks. We get great plumbing fixtures out of Quebec. If it's twisted up on you, fix it. You don't want to have a big knot on your threads. Here we go. And I like three runs, maybe four. Because um, it's not just a sealant, it's a lubricator and a sealant, okay? It fills in all the gaps so the water can't escape, but it also lubricates brass on brass so that you can tighten it up more. So that's finger tight, okay? And that's with the wrench. And one of the ways you can tell if, if it's good is <laughs> if they both have the same depth. just be me being paranoid but I'd rather be paranoid than have a leak <laughs> okay Ugh. if you're not sure if you're strong enough to make that work get a, a longer wrench okay or even get this and put it in a vice grip on a table or something the longer the wrench the more torque you have okay so if you're small and tiny and you're doing your own plumbing just buy a wrench uh, like a crescent wrench with an adjustable end so it can't slip off and get it with like a like a foot and a half long. You can even take a big piece of pipe. This isn't the greatest example, but you can put that over the end and then you can really torque it from here. Old fashioned science, right? The further away you are from the point, the more power you have. So that can make up for the difference. There's a center line for you. Okay, it's close enough. Ah, sometimes you don't need a laser level. Eh? Now, this right here, because I read the instructions, this goes on the center line. That makes life really simple, doesn't it? Okay, and in order to have lots of flexibility of the pipe, I'm going to go just a little bit higher here and confirm with my wall plate that that's going to work. Okay, remember, end from the beginning. Now, even to go all the way up to the top of this wood, I still have enough room for this plate. It's going to look a little silly, so I'll bring it down a couple inches. All right. So let's try this out. Yeah, I'm really comfortable there. I think we're going to be fine. Okay, so I want my water line to go to there. And that tells me where to cut the pipes. Okay. Let's do this. I've turned off the water. I've drained the taps. There should be nothing but air in here. If I'm wrong, Max is going to drop the camera and go running downstairs. Just joking, Max. You don't have to drop the camera. 
hear the air rushing? Now the line's really draining. If I was wrong, I'd be having water all over the place. <laughs> now you can see I can push down a little bit to about here, or I can lift it up to about here. That's my mercy, okay? It's good to know what your mercy is. When you're doing plumbing, it's best to go with pushing it down from mid contact. And then if you have a problem or your crimp ring doesn't work or there's a leak or something, you can then just yank it up and cut to the new line and reinstall, okay? You don't have to run a brand new line. And I'm going to put pressure while I turn so that it cuts through clean without collapsing the pipe. Because if all I do, see how round that is, right? Here's the other side. If all I do is crush it, it ends up going oval on me, okay? That's a lousy example. Here, let me just see how oval it can get. All right, before you cut it. So depending on the condition of your cutter, you don't want that. You can't operate with the O-rings with that. So twist while you're cutting. So then when you go to put the O-ring on, okay, look how easy that is. The oval side, you gotta reform the pipe. <coughs> It'll drive you crazy, okay? So twist and cut, makes the installation easy. Here we go, slide it right on there. Now, give it a bit of a pinch so it doesn't slide down on you, okay? Same thing. I'm going to go like this. Find my mercy. Woohoo! Now, that was rude. Are you done? Okay. So there's exceptions to every rule, isn't there? If it wants to slip, just give it a bit of a squeeze so then it won't slip. Okay, now put the hot in. And the way you know this is in North America, generally speaking, hot's on the left. If you are from Quebec, hot is usually on the right. Fascinating, isn't it? Not sure why, but that's okay. Just gotta know the rules of, the, of engagement for where you live. And, okay. Now that that's done, we're gonna go turn the water back on. I have no idea if this is off. Isn't that fun? So what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna put a set screw into this mount. So when I turn the water on, if it needs to be adjusted, at least it's uh, going in the right place, right in the tub. Okay? So the water can only come out here or here. <laughs> at, least, at least that way we're protected in case, eh? Might seem ridiculous, but that's not a test cap. That's the actual valve. And if it wasn't installed in the closed position from the factory, you know, I'd have a ton of water firing out right now, so. Ah, good. Oh, yeah. okay. Nice. Let's get this in a place where we're all comfortable. I think that's gonna be good. The way that we're going to find out if this is installed level is I'm going to put the plate on again, okay? Because this is level when we're done. If I can't get that in the right spot, there's no sense installing it, right? Beauty. Okay, what a great time to add backups to the system. Now, this is great because they've got top and mount top and bottom mount screws. If your wood is twisted, you can leave a little bit of pressure on, on the bottom, let's say, and then tighten the top. And you could, cause you really want this perpendicular off the wall. We don't know yet, do we? The only way to check that out, just go back into the box. Here we are. This will be the one that tells the truth. Knowing the end from the beginning, folks. That's what life is all about. Great time to check out how the system works, too. Okay. All right. Two inches. Two and a sixteenth. Doesn't sound like much, but I'm telling you right now, in my experience, that sixteenth is all the difference in the world. 
because when you tile, you're gonna have a gap at the top and none on the bottom. So, there we go. All right, perfect every time. All right, so we're roughed in. We know we're not leaking. The only thing left to do now is take all of these fancy little doodads, put them over top of your fixture. There we go. That's obviously for here. This one's for here. And what these do is they give you exact dimensions of where your holes go when you're doing your tile work and your wallboard, okay? So you don't necessarily need it here for the wallboard, but it helps, right? You have something to mark to? You can even get these lines, top and bottom. Look at that, these are 12, 3, 6, and 9, so that you can identify and measure to these grooves. Get your holes perfectly situated. Awesome. Now, before I go further, I still needed to put the four inch screws on the back of this to mount it to the floor. We're gonna take care of that. I'm gonna close the back of this wall up. We have a treat. In the shower, we use a, a, a relatively inexpensive cement. It's like 15 or 20 bucks a bag. Over here, we're gonna use a $45 cement because in this situation, I'm gonna put the back two tiles on and then the rest of this tub, I'm gonna tile from the top part and then go down. And I'm using a cement that'll hold the tiles in place so that I can build in the opposite direction. That way, because I have a slope on the floor, I can have perfectly horizontal level lines all around the top and then build down and measure to the floor from each point and cut everything perfect. This is good to know. For an extra 25 bucks a bag, you can get an ultralight white cement. And I bought it at Lowe's, but it's not called ultralight. It's just called lightweight mortar. They changed the package. Okay, so we'll show you that. We'll get through all that process. Uh, I'm just going to go put the back on now and show you how this is all done. Wrap it up, and then I'm going to show you how to drop a center line so that you can balance this out, okay? <laughs> There's no sense doing it yourself if you're going to do yourself in. It's, right, it's DIY, not DYI. If you can't make it look professional when you're finished, you shouldn't even start because you're going to devalue the project and devalue your home, all right? All these little steps, making sure everything's square and level and working from the center out and working from the top down. These are the things that separate professional jobs from homeowners who are just experimenting on their home. And you don't wanna be one of those, okay? You wanna do a really nice job so that when you go to sell, people go, wow, the finishes in here are awesome. Okay, first thing you're gonna notice here, guys, is this. Hot and cold, they're making contact. And if you're filling a tub, that's a lot of hot water mixed with a little bit of cold water. It's right over the hole. So that if it drips, it's gonna drip on the ceiling. So. Let's uh, keep them from making contact. That's a great place to use a scrap piece of lumber. Problem solved. All right, now, I have got some leftover structural screws from my deck, which are four inch long, and they're gonna be perfect. I couldn't install it the other day because I lost the bit that goes with them. So now that I have that, I'm gonna drop this in. There we go. We're gonna use Den Shield on wrapping the whole thing. And for the purpose of speeding up so we can get this filming done today before Max goes on holidays, I'm just gonna put the back on, show you how to drop your center line, show you how to work from the top down, and then we'll be able to kick him out of here and let him get on with his vacation, okay? He needs a break. <laughs> First of all, the height of this thing is a little bit more than 16 inch on center. Ooh, 28, ooh, so evil. In a perfect world, we could put an extra piece of wood on here, but I don't really care because I'm using a fiberglass wallboard panel that's incredibly rigid. And then once I have cement on this and then porcelain tile on this, the fact that there's no wood in the middle isn't gonna mean nothing, all right? You'd have to drive a car into this to make a dent. So we're not gonna get too worked up over the minor details here, okay? Remember, I'm not in a shower here. This is considered a dry area. So we don't have those annoying rules that wet areas have to worry about. We can be a little bit more free and creative. Okay, now I could take the time to scribe the board, but remember what I said about this, it's fiberglass board, it's not nice to work with. And so in order to make my life a little more simplistic, I'm going to split the gap and just install the darn thing. And if that bothers you, it's okay. There's different personality types in this world. 
Some people get worked up over the little things. So if it bothers you, then don't do that. Take the time, scribe it, wear a mask. I am more of a get things done kind of fella. So if it slows me down and there's a way to get around it, then I will speed things up every time. Remember, I'm covering this with one tile and then one tile, right? Is <laughs> there's not a lot of grout and deflection happening there after that cement is cured in 30 days. Now I'm just going to come by and trim it all off, right? Try to cut straight every time. You never know when an off cut can be something you can use somewhere else. Try to cut and measure, and you could try to measure and cut this ahead of time. Instead, just cut it like it's drywall. In drywall, we always just install it and then we trim it back. All right, and the only thing we have to worry about here now is making sure that it's not higher than the surface. So if the next piece of board goes on, okay, and you can use a rasp or you can just use your knife on the side. All right, here we go, guys. So I got this all wrapped now. Remember, our premise here went from the very beginning was to have two tiles high. I got a couple of cutoffs here to show you that. Plus grout line, okay, which takes me to this height. Now, my back wall will be two tiles, all right? And then this wall, I want it to come right to here. Make sense? See that? And then when I lay it, one on here, that's fine. But I have to start at the top, get the top row in. The back wall is key. And then everything I build off, both ends, if I'm always working from this grout line and working down, that all wraps around and all the lines will line up all the way across. Because we're also tiling the skirt on the front of the tub. So I have no mercy. I can't be different here than I am at the other end. So this is where laser levels and end from the beginning and really planning out and having a proper process makes a big difference. I'm going to have to even level this here and then scribe the tile on the other end until I get that perfect angle and then I can mark the cut for this end. There's going to be a lot of work involved with this, but if you want something sexy, it's going to take time and energy. You can't just get sexy and cheap and easy, right? I mean, ah, there we go. Now the other thing I want to do is I want to get this front tile done because the back wall is on a bit of a slope out. Okay, I want to be able to have that cut stone and angle up against the back and then cap it with something that's square. I'll get a much better grout line there than if I put this on first and then try to scribe the line up to it. Anyway, now I know that the back wall is going to be perfect. I can actually start building this side wall based on this grout line right here. One thing I should mention before you're doing a tile job, the larger the stone, um, especially with porcelain, the more prone to chipping and cracking they are in the corners. Okay, handling this material is very difficult. A lot of warehouses screw up on a regular basis. When you get your boxes, open up the ends, double check, okay, set aside stuff that's damaged like this, because it's really easy to use that in a place like this. Right? Nothing wrong with that. Haha. -ha. Okay, so one of the benefits of having an Alex in your neighborhood is they're always cutting the grass when you're trying to make a video. <laughs> okay. Uh, this might seem crazy, but what I'm doing here right now is creating temporary support for this tile. So that I can scribe this end. Okay, I gotta get this angle right first. So let me just double check it. Okay. Make sure that this is good. Yeah, this side needs to come up a little bit. This side's nice and flush. Oh, I don't have an accent here. This is gonna blow your mind, but the, the head on the screw is a pan head. So I'm gonna lift the tile a bit. Set it on the pan. There is my sixteenth of an inch that I needed. Bam, perfect. I've got the ability to scribe this line. And it is as simple as taking my tile setting it beside it, flat to the wall, and drawing my line. Okay, now I can run that through the wet saw, bring it back up here, and then mark where I want it to finish. It's a little up and down the stairs, but like I said, if you want it perfect, 
Do what you gotta do and make it perfect. <laughs> I had the angle wrong at the very beginning, so I had to make an adjustment. No worries, that's what grout's for. All right, now I'm just gonna use my square. Mark my spot. Here. Now, I like to cut on the black mark because my tile cutter on the wet sock cut square. And then this is all square and plumb. I don't have to draw a whole line, just a mark to get started. Like I mentioned, this is a ultralight white. Okay. This is a lot easier to work with than the cheaper cement. It's expensive, I know, but look how easy it is to put that on. It doesn't just drop off and land all over your feet, right? <sighs> Sometimes it's just worth it to pay the extra money. Now in this situation, I need it specifically for the fact that I'm going to be mounting this tile on this wall and I need it to stick. Okay, so we're gonna show you a demonstration of how well this stuff works. I'm going to get all the lines going the same direction. We don't need to back butter because it's a dry space. It's not a wet area here. But if you want to take full advantage of the suction capacity and the holding power of the cement, back butter your tire. Okay. It helps to create the vacuum. Just fill in all these grooves. Okay, here we go. <laughs> the way you do this is you want to set it a quarter to half an inch higher than you want it. All right? And then collapse the ridges with pressure. Here we go. Now I'm going to use these screws just to make sure and it's not moving while it sets, okay? We're gonna work on the next one. In about five or six minutes, this will set up enough that I can pull the screws out and it won't move. It's a little ridiculous, but that is the case. I'm also gonna to wanna to set in my leveling clips at this point. Okay, the rating on this tile for carrying 40 pounds is actually for on a ceiling, okay? It, it holds really well on a ceiling. On a wall, because it's a heavy stone, still a little bit of sag, you gotta give it some setup time. But this is gonna work just fine. Okay, now I get to do the same thing with the next tile. Bring it over, get it scribed, cut it, whew, and then we'll just build down, knowing that now we've got a level, plumb, perfectly spaced, and everything in this entire bathroom can be built off of that back wall grout line. <laughs> All there is to do now is go to the time lapse, and then we'll show you about grouting and finishing and sealing this up when you're done, so you're not gonna get mold developed later. Oh, but before the time lapse, let's just talk about dropping the center line and how to set up your marks so that you're always working from the middle and then left and then right from that center line. This will make it perfect. All right, so what we're gonna do, instead of measuring the totality of this structure, we have two options. We can go center of the tub or center of the structure. I'm gonna let you decide what you wanna do in that. On here I have a two by six wall. Here I have a two by eight wall. The line is gonna be so close it won't be funny. If I'm out an inch and a half here on the tub, it's gonna look really out of balance from here to here versus here to here. So I'm gonna go for the interior of the tub I always found that's the best way to go about it. And that is 65 inches on the inside, right? Because this is an extra size. So 65 and a half, 32 and a half. Let's get something here that I can make a measure with. Okay, now I'm just gonna drop a laser line on it. There we go. This represents my grout line. So there you go. Now I've got a, a line to measure, okay? So I can measure from here to this point, right in the middle of that tile. Remember, over here I'm gonna be putting a plastic edging. So I gotta leave room for that plastic edge. Cause I'm gonna finish at that point. And then the top tile will also sit flush at that point 
and it'll be about there, and then there'll be a plastic edging on it as well. So this is how we figure it out. Right in the middle of this tile is my line, okay? So now I can take this measurement, and I can install that tile, and then I can take this measurement to the wall, and I can install that tile, nice and simple. Okay, so we've got our, our faucet fixture finishing here, and all laid out. Um, generally, you want to go through all the instructions first, and then double check that you've got all of the right little tools and gizmos, okay? The little Allen key for the set screws comes in the package. Um, and so we're just going to go through the assembly system here. There is a little ring here that is going to be used as a locking pin for the plate, okay? So this is actually going to get connected by three different functions and all three of them have a different way of putting pressure on the plate to hold it tight to the wall. So it's going to look really amazing when it's done, but here we go. Let's just, step one, this is brilliant. There's going to be a little hole in the tube that always leaves at the front, just in case any water finds its way in here. That's all that's for, okay? Nice and simple. Now, there's also this ring here, and this one threads on. Go backwards until it sits nice. Okay, that is going to give you a nice look and it maintains a gap so you don't have rubbing, okay? Now, there is part of this locking system for here is this little piece, really peculiar. Okay, and it has, it's a set screw. That's the functioning side and it faces down and it actually gets set into the trim. And then after it gets done, you can push on the plate and set the screw into this, okay? Because this is pulled forward against this locking nut. Okay, so you can create pressure. Now, we're gonna slide this all into place. Okay, great. We'll get to that later. First, we're gonna take this piece, stick it back on, and this is, the, this is to create the pressure here, right? Okay, there we go. Now it's in place. But it's not creating pressure. So I'm gonna use my screwdriver to turn this threaded piece into the valve body until I get my pressure that I'm looking for. Right, there's no more movement. There we go. Awesome. Don't use pliers because these two little washers on the top here, they need to be in perfect condition. You gotta protect them. That's why we had the covers on while we were tiling. It protect these washers so that all of these little nuances actually end up working for you. Now, here's our fitting piece. You can see there's a washer in here. That's good, that's what we're gonna need because the hose has threaded end. So we have a washer, it means we don't use tape or, or goo, okay? It keeps it nice and clean. We slide this on, all right. And then there is a set screw and generally, it didn't take a few turns. When you feel it getting tight, that's good. We're gonna go one more turn. Now what I wanna do is make sure this is nice and level. <clears throat> okay, good. That one's done. This is the tub filler. Amazing. It actually has two set screws, not one. That's, some, that's intense, okay. Again, it just slips right on. And then we're gonna tighten up those screws. <clears throat> Good, it's almost too easy, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> now, this particular handle, the Rebel Pro line that we're working with, this smooth part of the valve body is actually the handle, the part that turns, to turn the water, water on or off. Oh boy. I did it, didn't I? What? <sighs> yep, I forgot to turn the water on. Whoops. <laughs> so I forgot. Um, I have to open up the hot and cold water lines as, as part of the valve body first. I'm doing this out of order. I almost forgot. I've done this before. Right in here. Both of those set screws have to be pointed vertical instead of horizontal. 
You don't have any water coming out. <laughs> New modern valves have got accessibility like that built into the design. So be really careful about that. Okay, and we're back. So now I'm caught up to where I should be. <laughs> now we can put the handle on. As I was saying, you've got two set screws here. So make life easier. Put it in position and then slide it on. Okay, and then you turn the bottom until you make contact. Not too tight. Okay, and then you can go sideways like this and get some good torque ability, okay? <clears throat> really want to dent that set screw into the brass, okay? Now we got control. Good. Okay, now this is for our thermostatic valve. Okay? This one here just slides right on, and again, it has a set screw. This sets your temperature. What you want to do is, in this scenario, you can take this Allen key, and you can release the set screw, okay? And you can change your temperature all the way hot and all the way cold. So look at the, look at the variation there, right? So if you like a really hot tub, you can just kind of dial it back a little bit and then reset it. So it always is up and down at the temperature you like, okay? So you don't have this, you know, sitting weird looking. So we're going to just dial that back just like that a little bit. And we're just going to set the screw in here for now. And then when we're all done, we'll get the water running and then we'll check to see where we'd like to have it sitting. Now, let's deal with the hose. Hopefully watching this video, you guys all realize that plumbing is not all that tricky. You should feel empowered to be able to do this on your own. This is the end that goes in here. Remember there's a washer in that. We'll just thread that in. I'm going to do a water test to see if doing this finger tight makes enough compression with that gasket or if I have to get a wrench and set it on there. I'm pretty sure that that's going to be enough. The washer that came with the kit goes in here and we're going to simply connect up here now. Well, the, sec the secret here is to adjust this hose. Okay so that it's comfortable. Hold it with your fingers. Hold the top with your other fingers and now tighten. So you're not twisting the hose into a kink. Okay? You're gonna have to run this a couple of times until you get it where you want it. Yeah, that's pretty nice, I like that. Okay, <laughs> Now before we put all of our caps on, Okay, I've got two here, one for the top and bottom here. We're gonna get out of the way a little bit. We're gonna test this out. Whew, okay, here goes everything. Okay. Okay, well here we go. We have got a problem, Houston. You know, that might be something really simple, but it might be something not so simple. We'll find out. Okay, so let's just make sure we got water coming through. Yeah. That one's working. Mm-hmm. So that goes to the middle. That's off. And then that goes to that tub. 
So that's all the water I got. It's just a dribble. That's supposed to be the hot side, I guess. So that's about the highest flow rate that I'm going to get to fill the tub. So my problem here is I didn't, I didn't have my cold line open all the way. And this thermostatic valve it works different than the showers I've worked with. They, the functionality here is the handle turned this way turns on the middle, which is the wand. The handle turned this way turns on the tub faucet. Okay. And this is your temperature setting. All the way to the left was cold water. And it's only designed to mix a little bit of cold water in. So with the valve being half open and all cold, there was no water coming through. So once I opened the valve properly, and then I adjusted this to the hot, okay, so now it's under full pressure. It's working great. So now I've got where I want. Now I can close this up. It kind of makes sense, you know, to make sure that your water and te temperature and everything is perfect before you move forward. Kind of put cart before the horse there. All right. Yeah, there we go. That's working. That's really nice. And then, beautiful. Now the only thing left to do here is get my almond silicone out, dry up my areas and do all my joints. Okay, now I'm using the almond caulk. All right, it's a silicone product. We're gonna do it anywhere I have tile intersecting tile or tile intersecting the tub. And it was gonna work this easy. Now, I'm just gonna put a small bead everywhere. Smooth and wipe as I go. This is gonna be beautiful. Actually, before I go any further, I gotta install the trap door. All right, the beautiful thing about Velcro, guys, this is basically what I'm doing. And I'm just gonna kinda guesstimate. As long as I'm anywhere close when I put these on, we're gonna have great contact. Right. Of course, the way that you take that out when it's time is you grab one of those cute little yellow suction cups that they sell at the Home Depot. You can just stick it on, close the handle, pop it out when you need to. That one's done. Out of sight, out of mind. All right, now that the trap door is done, Let's just get back to finishing all the silicone work. Guys, if you like this kind of videos, give us the video a thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you're new to home renovation and DIY. Now, for those of you who aren't aware, I'm in my master bath in my 1880s farmhouse. We're almost done renovating the entire project top to bottom. This is the last major project is this remodel. And we're doing about a six or seven part video series on remodeling a bathroom. So make sure you subscribe to the channel Hit the like button if you like learning how to do this kind of stuff yourself so you can take make a ton of money Now what I just marked here is my four foot line Okay, because I'm going to be cutting out four feet of drywall And the reason I'm cutting out four feet of drywall Well, that's the size of drywall at the store <laughs> So I'm going to make my life simple by cutting the hole the same size as the sheet that I need to buy to cover up the hole when I'm done Makes sense. So that's going to be my hole and I'm going to make it almost the entire six feet, okay? And I'll tell you why. Because right now I've got my plumbing stack here, and the vent goes up. When I change the plumbing and I have two drains, I also need those vents to go up and then travel across and reconnect with this venting higher than the sink if it was full of water to guarantee that I'm always going to have fresh air coming to that drain. If I connect too low, I can eventually fill up the fresh air venting system with water, and then I'm in a whole heap of trouble. So this is why I'm going all the way up to four feet. It makes no difference if you patch a big hole or a small hole, it's the same amount of work, all right? So just give yourself lots of room to work, and you'll save yourself time in the end. Now, I'm gonna show you two different techniques for cutting. If you have a drywall cutout tool, it's a lot faster, but most people don't buy tools specific like that for their DIY home projects. This is a saw. It's just like 12 bucks, okay? And you can cut drywall with it. The secret here is you can also cut your electrical and your plumbing supply with it. Ah. So, you wanna be really careful. You're only cutting with about inch and a quarter, inch and a half, all right? One of the tips you can do is you can take a black marker and just mark the blade. So when I'm cutting, and when that black disappears, I know I'm going too deep. 
and then you'll get a feel for it. Plumbing and electrical code requires that everything is recessed in the wall an inch and a half, okay? So you're not going to accidentally cut things this way. Or, if you don't want to waste all day long with a saw, you can buy yourself an Ofa knife. Follow our link in the Amazon in the video description. And you can just set this to an inch and a quarter. Now, most drywall is only half an inch thick. And you can just pull a line through it. Usually by the second pass, you've gone completely through. And don't worry if it takes you three or four. It's just experience talking. All right. This isn't about being perfect. This is about getting most of it the first time. You'll just notice that when you get near the end, when you start pulling the drywall apart, there's always going to be areas that you don't get cut right because there's screws to the wall. Just bumped into wall stud there, and it's not going to slow you down. And the other side. my breath a bit. Around your electrical, take a pair of pliers or a, a hammer, disengage the drywall around the box so that everything comes clean, all right? And then get the first corner out of the way. This is not something where we're trying to save this material, okay? That'll drive you nuts. Just want to reach in here. Shake it so all the drywall screws pop through the paper and then they just rip out the other side. Okay, be gentle around your plumbing. There we are. So now that I've got the wall open, it's time for me to make my material list. A, I'm going to change these fittings on the pecs. These are old crimp rings. I'm going to go to the solid ring, it's a lot better plumbing. And I'm going to need T's so I can run the hot water in two different directions. And T's for the cold water run that in two directions. And I don't have a lot of room to do that. So for whatever reason, this is a two inch pipe. I'm going to cut this out, a big section of it. I'm going to change it to inch and a half. That'll give me room to run my, my plumbing line through the wall to the other side. I'm going to put a T up here. Okay, and we'll find the location later. I'll bring it down and then to the drain. Same thing, okay, over to here. And so we'll end up cutting this out and putting in a, a T that goes in two different directions. Bring it out to this way and then bring venting up and off and reconnecting venting up top. Piece of cake, really. The secret is not having enough space to know exactly what's going on so that you can make one trip to the store, buy all your supplies and not be surprised as the job progresses. This will be a piece of cake. Well, now that I got my measurements, I know exactly what I'm going to be doing here. Let's just go over the changes to my plan. Originally, my plan was to take the drain and, and vent system here and tee off in both directions and install the vanity basically where the hole is cut out now. Now that we've worked on the tub and got that other thing, the, the water out of the way, the room feels so much bigger. It just seems wrong to not center this on the wall. So instead of using this, okay, and converting one here so that we can bring our drain left and right, and one up here to reconnect the venting. I'm going to maintain this system right now, and I'm going to just cut it here and bring another drain over to this location, all right? And I'm going to be making this the center of my, my wall and the center of my vanity, okay? So that means I've got to bring hot and cold to within three inches of the drain on each side to fit the back of the vanity. And I've got to run all everything over, tee it all off to do it again over there. So I got to open up a little drywall. I'm going to unscrew these boxes, get them up out of the way because I'm going to do this really simple. I'm not going to drill a bunch of holes through the wood. I'm simply going to take out my skill saw and cut my lumber and notch it out and put on some great big steel plates afterwards to protect the wall because this is not structural. This is the benefit of, of interior walls. You can 
cut them back to almost nothing, and then just slide your plumbing in. It's an easy DIY system. I think you're going to like what I'm going to do. All right, so first thing, let's disengage the electrical. There we go. And then we'll mount these up and out of the way. And that looks like there. Yeah, there's wood there. There we go. Now, now this is out of the way, right? It's perfectly safe. Everything's still screwed together, but I don't have to worry about anything because remember when you're renovating, you start with the things that are the least flexible, like ductwork. Then you move on to your, your drain and your venting. Then you do your electrical, okay? So if any of that's in your way, get it out of your way. Same thing with the water lines. I'm gonna do the drain and the venting first and then the water supply. Always make sure that you've got the ability to be flexible, right? You don't want to be committed to doing something stupid. All right, so before I go and cut the water line and I have no recourse but to hold my thumb on it and scream for help, I'm going to just try this slow and see if there's any water pressure left in this line. Pretty sure I turned it off and opened up the faucets. I got busy talking to Max. Let's find out. Of course. That's just be silly, wouldn't it? Here we go. We're going to cut back here because we don't want to have nothing to do with this old style of plumbing. We're upgrading, okay? Ah. Now, these are shark bites, so I'll be able to save them for later. We're not using them again after the fact. We're gonna put um, PEX caps on everything. So we'll just reuse these later some other day for an emergency. Now, here we go. This is perfect. I love this height. This one comes through the stud. It's gonna be really awkward for me to try to make any changes. So I'll have to tee off from here, and that will be all right. According to my measurements from my center line, which is now here, and 20 and a half is a perfect location for my drain. Really, really close here. So we're gonna just call that perfect, because I can do that. Okay, and then 20 and a half from here. So I gotta get to just the other side of that brown mark. All right, so if I go two feet, let's see, yes. One sheet of drywall will fill this hole. Perfect. Okay. So, let's just get on with it. And the way I draw that line is I'm actually lifting with my knees and holding my arms straight and just standing straight up. It usually works pretty darn good. Okay. Okay. 20 and a half. Oh, that's to the center. I didn't go over far enough. All right, we're gonna go add another few inches. I'm gonna cut this pipe at about three quarters of an inch so I can set this over top. Okay, that's a female end. And I need to cut my pipe here and here. All right, and then because it's a drain, I've got to go that's level, and I'm going to go a little bit off level, one degree. It's almost two inches wide, because the inch and a half refers to the interior dimension, okay? That's the diameter of the inside of the pipe, inch and a half. The exterior is almost two inches. So, I can make my life simple and just put this on that existing line and make a mark. Here we go. And then when I cut, I'm gonna cut on the inside of each of these lines, okay? That way my pipe will fit in that groove and the plate that I buy will be big enough to go over top of the hole. Now, we also have venting. We're going to tie in for venting up here somewhere. Yeah, let's do this nice and tall. And mark that pipe here. Same thing, only different. Only this one, we're going to have a downward slope. And the reason for that is, when you put this pipe on and you've got this curl, there is rainwater and that sort of thing that can work its way into the pipe, okay? So if I have an, a slope this way, it'll actually get trapped in here. And I don't want water sitting in here. So we're gonna slope it this way because it can come down and then it can follow this drain and then go down there again. That made any sense? I hope it did. So we're gonna go level and then downward slope. Okay, there we go. That was the math. <laughs> 
Not too tricky at all once you see it coming together, right? Okay, so the secret to cutting a pipe is a small reciprocator. I would prefer to have a smaller blade even, okay? What you want to do is you want to hold steady and then you want to Shoot through like crazy, but this close to the stud, I've got all kinds of issues. I don't want to cut backwards, upside down. I don't want to go in the other wall. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go get my multi-tool. I know, every six months, I pull it out for just a minute and a half. <sighs> okay. So now I got my multi-tool. And because I'm a genius, my power is still engaged. <laughs> Whoops. Genius can't fit in a plug. Now, you know I should show you? Because honestly, these are a couple hundred bucks, right? And if you're doing a DIY project at home and you're not, you don't have tools like this, there's another option. I'll show you one. You go to the hardware store and you can ask them for a um, ABS or PVC pipe saw. It's a wire saw. Kind of works like this. The wire goes around behind, okay? And it's got rings on it. It's kind of like from an old movie where someone's sitting in the back seat, but they don't check the back seat when they get in the car. And then the guy leans over and, and he chokes you to death, right? Well, the wire saw works like this. And you just hold those rings and go back and forth. You can slice through a pipe in any situation for six bucks. All right? So there's a great DIY solution there. I used to have one. God only knows what happened to it. Most of my tools end up in the garbage because all well, my kids work with me. And now we can go have some fun. Pipe's got a little bit of flexibility out there. Nice. I got a trick for you. There's um, a lot of play here, and I don't know why. So, what I'm gonna do, do an old trick that a plumber showed me one time when he was doing a um, galvanized replacement pipe situation. Okay? So what he did is he took this, the all-round strapping that you can buy at the plumbing store, okay? And he went like this, and he wrapped the pipe, and he threw a screw into a stud. And what it does is when you cut the next piece of pipe, it holds it where it is, so it's not moving around. Because you don't want to do your plumbing, cut your pipe, and have whatever sitting up top. Let's say it's, a, it's teed up and it goes across the room, right, it's not supported properly, and then it comes down. And then you go and do your measurement. Now you've got, potentially, you've screwed up the slope and what's going on in the attic. You don't want to do that. So strap your pipe, connect it to the wall, and then you can go. It's like giving a kid a haircut around his ears, eh? There we go. And when you're done this, it makes a mess, okay? So you're going to want to just take a knife, and cut all of these burrs off. Because really, a vibration tool like that, it doesn't cut as much as it melts. So it's like a bunch of candle wax all around the pipe, okay? So cut back all these burrs inside the pipe as well because this is gonna be a drain, okay? So we don't wanna have that rough stuff sitting there. It'll catch all the hair. Up top, it's only vent, so it doesn't really matter. Be careful with this, right? Just pay attention to where the knife's gonna go if it slips. Now what I'm about to do should not be possible because I can't find one and a half inch ABS anywhere in Ontario. Don't know why, the stores are out, all my suppliers are out, can't find it, but through the power of me being a hoarder, I still had a couple of lengths sitting in my shed. And you're damn right I kept that shed locked all, all year. Um, <laughs> building materials, if you have something rare, they're a real commodity. So, I've got this and I've got a couple of six footers. So I'm gonna be okay to just do all this an inch and a half, which is great. If you're stuck and you wanna do this project right now and you can't find one and a half, you're allowed to use two inch pipe and fittings, okay? What you need to do is do this. At some point, you're gonna to have to go to inch and a half in order to do your P-traps and everything else. So you're gonna to have to scrounge up a couple of inches of this stuff. If you open up your wall, you might already have one and a half inch from here going up. Cut it out, switch to two, and use this pipe so that you can put your stems on for your new P-traps, okay? Because you can use a conversion like this from two to one and a half, or you can get a two-inch coupler 
okay? And this is called a bushing. And it's two inch insert, and then one and a half goes inside of that. Those are your options. Okay, so you can convert from one and a half to two anywhere you need. I am using this, which is very common in the, in the building store. It's a two inch drain, inch and a half here and an inch and a half here. And the reason for that is it's very, very common that the drain coming off of a sink is also the vent for other things in the room. So a lot of times this is what we'll see. Okay, boom, right like this. And this is actually the vent for the shower or a tub or a toilet or something else in the room. So that's why if it's gonna be a drain and a vent, it needs to be a two inch pipe. That's why we have it. So if you have to do everything in two inch pipe and then just convert so you can have inch and a half stems, that way you've got the right plumbing, you can do that. Let's call Thor and have him open up the damn plumbing cap. Ugh. If you don't have a cheap pair of $4 wrench, you're not getting these open. You know, I don't, I don't care who you are. This, this is just tough. Now, uh, we're putting in a new floor, so I don't care if I get this all over the place. I'm gonna try to be careful, but I'm ahead of myself. I haven't cut my hole yet. Whoa, ho, ho, ho. slow down, Jeffrey. Slow down. Let's check our battery power. No worries. Let's check our depth. Remember, my pipe is two inches. I'm not, not enough yet. Mm, let's try that. Two, two inches. Two and a quarter. I like that. Two and a quarter is good. Okay, so we're gonna cut everything at two and a quarter. Hopefully this all works. Yeah, let's see how that works. Okay. Now, on my saw, I took my, my cut line, the zero line, and I put a black marker on it. All right, it helps make it really easy to identify when you're cutting, because I got black marker on the wall, I got black marker here. My life just got really simple. I put the black mark on the black mark. Yeah, perfect every time. Uh, and this is how we release the stud of the burden of that chunk of wood. Nice and easy. And now we got a nice place to run our pipes. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Time for the glue. No mask required. All right. You want to glue the fitting and the pipe, okay? This is not really glue, we call it glue, it's a solvent. And as such, you want to actually melt both the fitting and the pipe. So then when they meet, they meld together. Did I actually get that just a hair off, eh? Dang, nab it. Okay, we're gonna connect this first, okay? Well, we have the luxury of being able to move everything up and down. And this is going to be a 19 inch piece of pipe. What I generally do when I'm dealing with this pipe is I'll measure and cut to a place where I know I'm gonna see the printing. 19 inches is right, be right between the 28. If you haven't seen any of our plumbing videos before, this is just a, it's a pipe cutter. It's only for inch and a half ABS. It has a little bit of a tooth on here. So you're gonna to wanna to set the middle of the the middle of the fixture where your 19 mark is, and that's right between the two and the eight. Twist and pull, and then shoot. That's that easy. All right. The other advantage of this is it doesn't cause burrs. It's no melting. It actually cuts the pipe. So, ah, we gotta be a little quick with this. Again, you wanna melt the pipe on both ends. Okay, set it. Time, time is of the essence. And forget it. Step one complete. We want to come across here. Two. 
to 20 and a half from my center mark. That's where I want my drain. So that's going to be long enough. That's good. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is take a marker and mark the center line on the back of that wall. So 20 and a half. This is 17. So I got to go three and a half. Okay. So this is my center line. All right. So now I got a piece that's going to be long enough. I got a center line. I have to get my fitting. Now, what I'm using is a T. Okay. It's okay to use a T in a wall coming off the off the faucet. But make sure that the water is flowing in the right direction. All right. And it's going to go here. It's not just going to go there. The center of this pipe is going to go on that center line. Okay. Let me just go and check. Well, wow, that's. That's basically right off the wood. That makes it easy to measure. So I need, because I'm going to be here, I want to have three quarters of pipe for the inside the fitting. Three quarters plus to the inside of this fitting, 36 and a half. Okay, 36 and a half is between the F and the 6. Here's my tool. Here's my line. And when you cut it, you're better to cut it just a hair short, all right? These fittings, if it's in that far and it's, it, it's square, it's still going to work. It's better to work until it's right all the way in. To get it all the way in actually requires a fair amount of glue. Once the adhesive is on there or the solvent, then it works together much better. Now, um, uh, what I'm going to connect here is to save a fitting. This is called a street 90, okay? Because this end is big enough for an inch and a half pipe to go in, and this end is inch and a half pipe. And so it's a fitting that goes right in the end, okay? So I'm going to put these two together before I get started. Mm -hmm. If it's on the floor, it's so much easier to get that 90 degree angle, all right? We're going to put that in first. Okay. The thing is, is that it's tendency to want to sit low. So now I'm going to take some of this all round strap. I'm going to glue that end. I'm going to take some strapping and tie this up nice and tight to maintain my drain. If you're doing a plumbing job, go and buy a coil of this stuff. It's five or six bucks. Um, there's so many uses. It's just crazy, right? You're going you're gonna to just thank me because sooner or later you're going to run into a situation like, oh, I wish I had the all round. Just get it now. Here's how you cut all round. The electrical side cutters. Okay. Right there. That's it. Done. Okay. So now we're ready with that. I've got a screw here. Because we're doing that one under pressure. We'll do this joint first. Now, while it's still setting up, that's the time to do this, okay? Put the screw through one piece, through another piece. Don't even worry about it. Because what we're going to do is we're going to screw this on an angle. Okay? See that? And that's just going to keep on pulling until we get it set right where we have maximum torque. Done. Everything's out of the way. Okay? Yuppers! Now we're good to go. Okay, make sure you got an angle straight up. If you're not sure, stick a piece of pipe in it. Make sure it's not sticking out like this before the before your solvent sets, okay? You got a little bit of mercy here. You got a few minutes. All right, now we're in the right direction. Next thing we're gonna need, six inches, no solvent here. Push it in. Make sure while you're at the store, you buy one of these. They come in blue as well, okay? Um, different plumbers use them for different things. For me, orange means that it's attached, and blue means that it's not attached. But I have a free one, so I'm gonna use it, okay? It's up to me to remember that 
that's not glued when I come back later. What if I need this to come out just a little bit further for the sink? You don't know until you know. So leave it alone, test cap it. Always when you're removing a test cap, check to see if the pipe is attached. It's just a really good habit. All right, in case you didn't do that joint, you'll get everything installed and you'll be like, oh, look at that. There's a little bit of water in the bottom of the vanity. You'll think it's a water supply or the taps or something. It's just a little drip coming out of here because it's just not quite snug enough without the adhesive. I keep calling it adhesive, and if you're in the comments going, it's solvent, man, it's solvent, then that's fine, I guess, you know. You wouldn't be surprised how many times people have yelled at me in the comments because it's plumb, not level. Well, I'm Canadian, okay? We're a little weird. Let's just make sure that this is right. You know the old expression, right? Everybody says, a, a jack of all trades, eh? Well, that's not the expression. The expression is, a jack of all trades is better than the master of one because he's more competent on the job site. Ooh. All right, let's take a piece of pipe here and mark the center line. Boom, all right, draw the line up. Great, that was easy. This pipe's gonna come across, right? Probably around there. There we go. Okay, so here's my intersection. Okay. So, boom. There's the inside corner, all right? So this is the mark that I'm gonna measure to. Make sense? So now I'm going to measure from here to here, and that comes out to be 17 and 3 quarters. Okay. Always write down a measurement. And then I'm going to go from here. Boom. Looks like about 40. Now, when I'm doing this, I don't have a lot of flexibility here, right? So if I put this pipe in, and I glue it there, and then I glue this here, See, now I'm limited. I don't really have enough room here to stick them on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this pipe in, and I'm going to put this pipe in, and then slam it over. Okay? Just always think about your installation and pick the easiest connection to be the last one. Okay? It's not always just come all the way back to here. Maybe there's not a lot of flexibility. Just look for the opportunity to say that's the easiest connection. Yeah, this is the best advice I can give you. You're on your own. You gotta figure it out. Because this is venting, we can use these uh, sharp 90s. Okay, because it's mostly air. If this was drain pipe, because we only have drain from here down. This is drain, but a, a, a sweeping T is okay. You're supposed to go with really big 90s now. Whew. World has changed. Really big 90s. So if you're getting your plumbing inspected, make sure you put in big sweeping 90s or 245s, or they will give you some serious heck and make you do it all over again. It's kind of funny, you know, because back when plumbing first started, there was code, there was rules. And then uh, the rule was inch and a quarter pipe for a drain, galvanized. Yeah, crazy. And then they found out after, well, I don't know, you know, 30, 40, 50 years. Wow, this really doesn't work anymore. The drain stopped functioning because of all the corrosion and the fact that the water supply in people's homes was cast iron water supply. So then they changed everything. They got new building materials. And they changed the code. And then since then, they've changed the code and made so many modifications. Bottom line is, when it comes to plumbing, um, the longer it sits in a wall, the less it'll work for you. <laughs> There's no escape. You're going to run into problems. So if you're still following uh, 1970 or 1980 building code, and uh, you're not getting inspected, and that's between you and God, but truth is, most of the latest upgrades, unless you're getting inspected, aren't necessary to even follow. You didn't hear that from me. Here we go. 17 three quarters. And a double check. Looks good to me. I'm gonna go to 18. You know, I got a piece that's still 18 inches. There we go, folks. The last piece of ABS pipe left in the city of Ottawa. I'm taking 18 inches of it. It's almost painful to watch. It's like eating an endangered species for dinner. <laughs> there we go. Call me if you want them. Huh? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Can the world just go back to work, please?
<laughs> Again, we're going to be quick here before everything sets up. Ah! All right, and snug is a bug and a rug. Hoorah. Okay, there's our waste and our venting finished and tied in. We're now done with the good stuff. Okay. Don't do that at home, kids. All right, here we go. Now, remember earlier I mentioned if you need to, you can go with two inch pipe everywhere. The danger of that is, is that two inch pipe is actually two and a half inch. So you lose a lot of space. So you gotta really pick your battles as to where you're gonna put your water lines. Um, the challenge with notching in the front is now my water line's gotta go on the backside, but I can't put metal plates back there. So I really gotta be careful not to go too deep. Check this out. Slow speed, middle speed, and high speed. Pretty cool, huh? I showed you that in case you only have uh, uh, the finances to buy one drill right now. That's the one to get. We did a video where I showed the differences and all the flexibility of the impact driver. So I'll link that. Um, it was in our subfloor series, I think, right, Max? Video description or check the cards. The reason I want to maintain this three inch rule is because the cabinet has already got a cutout in the back of it. And I don't want to have to add the drilling holes in the cabinet because it just looks cheesy, right? I'd rather have all the holes coming through the drywall nice and clean, come through that little slice that they've got built out. So take the time to always measure off your cabinet. Don't just assume, yeah, we'll set it at 18 or 20 and then within a few inches, yeah, yeah, take your time. This is important. Now, ah, to tee off. And this is why you always open it up on day one, make a list of everything you're going to need, and then go shopping and uh, buy a couple of extra of everything. Because <laughs> you can always take them back, right? Um, and when you're doing plumbing, feel free. <laughs> buy couplings. Get a couple couplings of every pipe size you're working with. All right? If you mess up a measurement and you don't have enough pipe to finish, you can always use a couple couplings to cut a pipe, stick it on, stretch it out a little bit. All right? Or make an adjustment and you can add two small pieces together with a coupling to make it work. So these are like, these are gold because they're like 69 cents. They can save you an hour long trip back and around to the store and that'll cost you like 10 bucks in gas. So while you're at the store, spend the 69 cents and have it on hand. Now, want to get our solid copper rings and then our, want to tee this way here. I'm gonna feed this through from the backside with the pipe already crimped on, and then I'm gonna roll it, and then I'm gonna cut it, and then I'm gonna attach it. And then I'm gonna grab a, uh, a stub out here. Again, we're gonna go, mm, find my tools. I'm gonna go about eight inches. Eight inches just seems to be the perfect depth whenever you're doing a, a stub out, guys. All right, now with PEX, of course, leave your quarter inch. And while we're at it, might as well put it on our cap. Okay, this is gonna be the biggest challenge of the day, getting this pipe in that hole. Step one, I, uh, it's nice to have a rule. If you're gonna put the fitting in, then crimp it, All right? Don't start moving forward until you've dealt with, because there's really, visually, it's very difficult to identify a crimped ring or a non-crimped ring until the water's on. That's the wrong time to find out. So, <laughs> if you put it on, crimp it. Eight inches of stub out here. 
here, we'll stick that on. Okay, there we have it. Water supply for our first sink. Within three inches of the center line, no problem, right? And if you're worried about the location of it, um, you can always grab a little bit of string and just tie them closer together, okay? And then when we come along with our drywall, we'll have it locked in place. So then you can roto zip all three holes, slide it over. Nice and clean. Now, this is going to be the tricky one. All right, so it turns out the best thing for me to do is actually drill new holes and then just bring it across, up and out. And I'm going to use this special fitting here to bend the pipe. If you got to make a turn, you want it supported or the pipe will break. Okay, so let me demonstrate. You just bend it across the metal and it locks in. And this piece here, this bridge, keeps it from crimping. It won't bend in half and kill your water supply, okay? They're like 89 cents. If you're gonna do plumbing, get them, all right? Worth their weight in gold. So in this scenario, I'm just gonna connect it and then I'm just gonna drill new holes. That's the easiest way for me to just move forward. Anything else is just gonna be a thousand fittings and I'm not in the mood for a thousand fittings. Fantastic, all right, now, I'm just going to let you know, I've finished my running through, I'm going to do a water pressure test now, because you want to make sure you test your line before you close it up. There is a special tool, uh, it's a gauge you can buy, and you can go around and set it on all, every one of these crimps and make sure that it's been crimped. That's how you tell the difference. I don't have the tool on me, I uh, got it with the package, I've never used it. Like I said, I got a rule, if I touch it, I crimp it, right? So. <laughs> I know some guys will do the whole thing and put it all together and then they'll come by and they'll crimp it all, but that's not me. Um, I'm happy just to do a water test. I'm feeling pretty confident about this. And it's a lot more exhilarating to do a water pressure test if you're not sure if you got it all crimped. All right, there we go. Let's just run through this again. I got a drain, hot and cold, within three inches, okay? That drain is higher, but <laughs> this one is actually a couple inches lower than normal. It's 20 inches as normal. This one is at 21, which is a little above normal. So, what I do is this. The P-trap for this drain, I'm gonna use this collar attachment, all right? So this is a one and a quarter interior for sinks, and this fitting sits right in the bottom of that P-trap, all right? That is a perfect way to get a drain assembled if you're a little bit high. If you're a little bit low, same thing over here, okay? But this one is an exterior pipe dimension. So then you cut the piece of pipe to fit. And there you go. That's all we need to know. So you can buy the male or the female version of that same fitting. And then when you thread it on the pipe, it gets nice and snug and watertight. Pressure test. All right, here we go. Okay, Max, are there any drips forming anywhere? Nope. No, any hissing? Nope. Okay, I'm going to go full blast. We're good. Perfect every time. <laughs> and we're back. Okay, so for everybody who uh, wants to see me do a pressure test, well, it's pressurized. What I do is I just give Max a call on my phone, and he just visually inspects this while I turn on the water. We wait about 10 to 15 seconds to pressurize the lines in the house. We're good to go. And like I said, with this kind of crimp, if it's not leaking now, it never will. Okay? There's no question. There's only one kind of pressure, full on. So now we don't have any concern because there's no degradation in that seal. You can even freeze that and it'll maintain its seal. It's a miracle. So I love this stuff. All right, guys, there we go. Okay, so now that I got the drywall on, just want to mention real quick, if you want to learn tips and tricks for doing drywall in weird situations and creative solutions to problems, we'll put a link in the video description and the card over here. Um, it's one of our top videos guys, okay? Millions of people have viewed it and love it and there's lots of great information there So if you haven't seen it, check it out Well, you're just gonna move ahead now. It's time to grab the vanity and get it in place Okay, we want to actually set it in position and then from there We're gonna be able to get perfect measurements for where all of our lights and our mirrors are gonna go And we can sort out all of that information with the stud finder come up with a plan and then I got to drill some holes Fix the wiring over here. Shouldn't be too big a deal. Cool. Okay, good. And, and set it down. This went by a lot easier than I thought. Wow. Well, nice. Okay, now we're gonna bunny hop it over about a foot and a half now. You see the holes in the plumbing for the walls? 
Looks dead center already. So it's a 71, 35 and a half. If anything, I'm a 16th off. Yeah. Done. All right. The only thing we're going to have a problem here, Matt, is uh, there's a really bad slope on the floor. Mm -hmm. So let's get the level in here. We'll see how much of a slope we have overall. Okay. Can you lift that end about that much? A little bit more? Keep going until this levels out. Look at that. We're looking at an inch and a quarter. We'll set it right on the right on the head. Okay. I wish life was always this this simple. All right. Mahala. Mm. <laughs> okay. Can you drop the, um, the foot pedal on that corner? I'm just trying to figure out which way is the right way. That is the right way. Okay. <clears throat> there we go. We're back to level again. Okay. That's the one I wanted. Now we got to go get the sink countertop. Set that in place because if you're like me, you're a visual person and it's a lot easier for me to map out what to do here with my mirrors and my lights and what, how I'm going to fix the wiring tomorrow once I've got the countertop in place, right? Besides, I also have somewhere to put my tools. <laughs> yep. And then, and then we'll worry about rolling it down afterwards, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to use the shims so help us, let's set it down and then manipulate it. Okay. So up and to the more in the middle. That's good. Watch your hand. It's in a lousy spot. Get the shim on the outside corner. Can you hold the, uh, well, the tilt? Well, here, if you move the shim, I'll yep. lift it. Okay. Now, this thing should roll pretty good, even if we're just off the front, okay? If you know what I mean? So there is about a half an inch overhang on each side. We can lift that a little How bit and come, come to you. Come so to th yeah. Okay. okay, now you, you can see that? Yeah. Now come right flush to the front. Yep. Yeah. Okay, now we should be able to just roll it in. No, nope. put your hand inside the sink. And then fingertips on the outside corner. Yeah, I get it, yeah, I'm here. On the, on the right side, yeah, yeah, not on the back, okay. Oh, you know what, hold on, let's back up. I'm gonna get my... You can hold it like this, yeah, okay. There's a lip inside okay. the sink. Yeah, I'm with you. All right. I'm just gonna squeeze out, nice and easy. Now, take the shim in the middle, please. Take the shim on my end, take the shim on your end. Okay, so I am quarter to three sixteenths. Yep. That's perfect. Oh. Now it's perfect. Okay. This is a 72 inch countertop, 36. Nice. What do you think? I think we did a good job. I think it works. I think there's room to stand here and open the drawers. I got three drawers downstairs. Let's just get them in, okay? Um, less things laying around on the floor, the better. Okay, so once you bring your vanity up, guys, the before you put your countertop on, make sure you level it all off, right? So corner to corner, back, front, going in three different directions with a shoulder level this way. There's a lot of different ways you can balance this in. And depending on your floor and your conditions in your home, you might even have to cut the feet like I did, all right? So that's fine. Do what you gotta do, but make sure that the, the, the place that people see, the most prominent corner, looks the best and then make all your adjustments everywhere else if you need to leveling feet cutting the legs whatever you got to do but you want this to be level and you want it to be flush to the wall you don't want to have a gap opening up okay and then we're in a great position now i can get my laser line out 
and I can draw a laser line off my sink faucets and draw my center lines for my mirrors and then I have a line that I can measure from to open up the wall and move my electrical room. It's going to be a piece of cake. All right, guys. So what I'm doing is I'm drawing a laser line here. I want to have it going through the center of the hole and through the center of the drain. Because this is eight inches off the wall, if it's center on these two points, it's going up this wall center. I'm not going to have any issues, right? So I'm just going to go like this and like this. And turn this off before I go blind for the purpose of helping you all out i'm going to be left-handed for two seconds okay we're going to put a big c on that that's your mark so you can measure off this line left to right in every direction draw laser lines anywhere you need this is going to be the center of the mirror right and while we're at it i'll show you the fixtures that okay now you can see and this mirror has got these little clips so I need to have two positions for the screws, right? It's going to be interesting. Okay, guys, so because not everybody's going to be interested in mirrors and lights and all that sort of stuff, we're going to make that a separate video, okay? We're going to add that in. You can watch all that next week. Right now, let's go get into the uh, connecting of all the plumbing. We'll drop in the faucets and the sinks, and we'll get all that hooked up and check the water. Do that last water test, so then you know that at least you got your water taken care of and you're not going to have any leaks. And then next week, we'll show you how we finish all of the rest of this wall. Cheers. When it comes time to do your plumbing on your vanity, there's a lot of people who say, oh, you should attach the taps first before you put the countertop in. But if you saw us put that in, can you imagine having two sets of taps and faucets and water supply lines on a six foot vanity that's already a couple hundred pounds and try not to screw that up? Really difficult, right? So it's, I always prefer to be um, uncomfortable when I'm doing my plumbing, then take a risk of damaging everything while I'm trying to save a step. Anyway, uh, turn off the water, drain the lines. We're gonna do the water supply first, then we're gonna attach all the faucets, and then when that's done, then we're gonna connect all the drain, okay? You don't wanna have the drain installed and then be crawling up there upside down trying to tighten the faucet connections. That'll drive you crazy. So do this in the right order and it makes it simple. First thing of course is we've drained the lines for a few minutes now. We are going to squeeze and turn. And there's always a little bit of water. God help us all. The more patient you are with draining your lines the less pressure will be in the system. Yeah. That one's had more time to drain. Well, now that that's out of the way, I'm going to show you the easiest DIY plumbing shutoff valve system on the market. I love this for a couple of reasons. One, it's just push connect, shark bite shutoff. Two, it's just a 90 degree turn. That's open when it's in line, and that's closed. We don't need this cap. And now I'm going to go into the phone and be right back. These shutoff valves also come in 90 so you can have it come out and the water supply comes up and the shutoff valves on the front where i went shopping they were out of inventory i'll tell you right now um ever since the storms in texas last year companies like sharp right have had a horrible time keeping their stuff in inventory starting to get a little closer to normal but sometimes you're just going to have to be flexible you're going to find the water supply right so the water supply lines on the real pro faucet that i bought are like 20 to 24 inches so they'll have no problem coming down and looping back in uh, at a later date, if I get a chance, I might change it to 90s, but for now, it's just nice to get it finished. So we're going to start off with these things in the closed position. Get rid of the decorative caps. And we simply are going to press and twist. All right, and you want to get about one inch on this pipe back. So do yourself a favor and set your thumb about an inch or so back so you know when you're almost there. Because that's not on. Okay, this is on. There you go. All right. Now I know I'm installed. That pipe got collapsed a little bit when I cut it. It's a little oval. You don't want to try to force the shark pipe on there like that. Make sure it's nice and round. If you want to make sure, grab one of your solid copper rings and slide it on that. And if it goes on without any difficulty, then you're okay. Okay? If you're fighting with it to get it on, you're going to fight with the shark pipe and you might cause damage to the fitting and then it won't work. Get that on there. There we go. Okay, so for ease of operation, I'm right-handed. 
I'm going to leave the shutoff valves on the right. Okay, there we go. That's set up. Woohoo! <laughs> now we get to go and assemble the faucets. All right, guys, so here's an 8 inch faucet set. Give you an idea how it works. You're going to have a water supply line and then a redirect back to the, the tap that comes out, okay? All right, and these are all deck mounted. <sighs> Just a note when, when my wife bought this vanity, it was kind of like a, hey, honey, I need this big, this dimension, two sink, whatever. I forgot to say, if you can find one that has a countertop that has single hole, all right, then the faucets are really affordable. When she went on the Wayfair site, majority of these countertops had three holes drilled in it. I don't know why the cabinet and counter people are in cahoots with the plumbing industry, but it takes three times as much effort to drill three holes as it does to do one. Okay, and guaranteed any faucet you buy, you can put on this counter because they do make single hole faucets that have the huge plate, right? But who wants a huge plate? If it was only one hole, you could get a single hole faucet. As it is, this is three times the price. And I had two of them. I'm so blessed. So, word to the wise when you're shopping. If you're worried about your budget, get a single hole for your sink. Anyway, this is a great demonstration how to hook up a sink because you get a whole lot more knowledge. There's a lot of parts, a lot of assembly, okay? Most of it is actually a lot simpler than it looks. All right, um, we're just gonna go through this. We don't need these. I've done these faucets a thousand times. I've been using Riobel Pro for 15 years, maybe 12. God, it feels like forever. Max, it feels like forever. So let's just go through all the parts. We'll just kind of like um, install them from the top first, okay? That's your water supply line I was talking about, right? That's gonna have no problem connecting to that shutoff valve down there. Right. Now, before we can drop it in the hole, we need something to keep it from falling all the way through. Just a word of warning, when you're undoing your packaging, see these little here? These little chrome stoppers, they're in a separate bag. It's not garbage, don't throw that out. They go in here afterwards, okay? What you're gonna do is you're gonna take each one of these water supplies, we're gonna throw this over top, okay? And it's gonna thread Go backwards. There you go. Till it makes a click noise. Spin it down a little bit. Get it out of the way. Now on this, you're going to see the little flat section. Okay, that goes on the top. All right, and you're going to thread that down until it doesn't thread anymore. Just finger tight, nice and easy. Okay, that's your stop. Now you can adjust this over time, but you want to have contact here, and I'll show you why. Okay, here's your handle. And it just sits right on, right in there. Boom. Okay, this space here is what guarantees no rubbing. All right. If you don't sink it down far enough, and then you install it, you actually make contact with the ring, and you're gonna get grinding and noises. You don't want that. Okay. So, finger tight all until it stops, and then back this plate up to it. Now you're ready to install it. Okay. Make sure this gasket is in its rightful position. And is there anything on this about left and right or hot and cold? Yes, these are marked. Okay, so this is hot line, okay? And the reason you want to have this all marked is because these faucets will open and close counter like in different directions. If you put them on the wrong side, they'll still function, but then your taps will look weird, okay? Get these, and that sits here. Boom. Well, that's pretty much installed. Same thing from over here now. Let's put the bottom on. The reason the flat section you want at top is if you ever have to do maintenance on this or replace it, you can put your pliers and grab the flat spot and you can loosen off that connection. After it's been there for a while, trust me, you're gonna need the pliers, okay? It only works great out of the box. There we go. Now that one's ready to go in. That's the cold supply. Now, the next stage is we do from underneath. The rubber gasket, it's like a hat. It's got a ridge on the top, all right? That's designed to go into this hole. That's it. It's a universal hole, okay? So it goes into the hole in the granite and sits flush. This is perfect. All the countertop people are making the same size hole out there, okay? So we take that, it goes underneath the counter, this gets up, and then we thread this on from underneath. And when you do this, you wanna back off the screws here a little bit, okay? This will thread it from underneath, and then you'll have this connection here. Then you take a drill with a drill bit and you can tighten this 
and it creates compression against the thread on here and the countertop. And that's what keeps the handle from moving around, okay? So make sure you get the right screwdriver bit, and make sure you give yourself lots of room here to create that compression. Now I gotta crawl underneath and get this done. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna install it upside down in the counter so you can see easily, all right? You take your washer with the, with the top of the hat pointing the countertop, okay? Now, there we go. That just starts to make a lot more sense now, doesn't it? If you don't see the assembly, it's gonna be difficult. Now, the same thing. Well, that sticker sure is in the way, huh? Okay. Same thing. Go backwards until it sits in the, in the groove. You don't wanna risk cross-threading this because if it's cross-threaded, you're done, right? Now you've made good contact. I could tighten it up a little bit more, but I wanna have the screws on each side because that's really easy for me to get a hold of with my drill. Grab yourself a six inch drill bit, okay? Because when you're underneath the, it's really easy to just go like this. Okay, see how much that moved? It's a fine thread, it's like an 832. Make you a good torque or two on there. Okay, now that's not going anywhere. Now that's exactly what I'm gonna do Put from underneath on my back. Now that we've got that set up, just to recap, this is a quick connect, okay? So this just pops in there, and then the two shorter lines just pop in here. Now your water supply is connected to your faucet. That's the easy part. We have this lovely little fitting here as well. And this is set up so that it could swivel if you want, or you can set it up with the washer and nut system from underneath, all right, and set it in place, which is what I'm gonna do should just sit there. I'm gonna crawl down one more time. I'm gonna take my tiny little wrench with me. Uh, they make little plastic wrenches for plumbers, right? Sometimes you can buy, and it has a kit, and it'll just be a little plastic gray thing that comes in there, and you can just throw a screwdriver and make a wrench out of it. It's not really needed. I'm gonna crawl under here and connect that, and then connect the water supply. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm getting too old for this scrap, Max. Mm, here we go. Hey. Just right on the shoulder blades is nice. Because if this was particle board, I'd probably destroy it because I'm a little bit overweight. If you didn't notice. Okay, here we go. Just like the other one. Rubber gasket first, then the brass plate. Now I can look up through the drain hole and see the faucet and kind of guess what square is. This is a great time to have somebody working with you. You can have them up there holding the faucet while you tighten the ring on. You can see why you don't want to have your P-trap and everything installed right now, right? Because everything will be in the way. So it's very important to do this in the right order. All right. One of the benefits, if you're working alone, intentionally have it out I've squared just a little bit. When I'm done tightening this on, and I go back up and I, I, I straighten that out, it'll be enough force to scrape, straighten that out that I'll be comfortable it's not ever moving again. <laughs> okay, I think I'm good with that. All of the water supplies. Okay, so cold line on one side. Just snap it in as far as it goes. Hot in the other. You see everything moves freely, okay? Now we're just gonna go Press it up right into the old, <clears throat> there we go. Woo -hoo. The secret here is make sure everything's nice and looped and not kinking. Next thing, of course, before we do the P-trap, let's get these water supply lines on. These are standard 3 8 water supply. It's the same everywhere you go. Whenever you buy um, shutoffs, they come in 3 8 threaded or they come in quarter inch threaded. Okay, and quarter inches for fridge lines, three eighths is for anything to do with your faucet in the bathroom. So make sure you get the right one. Once you finger tightened it, always take a little wrench with you, okay? Grab it and give it at least another good quarter turn. Finger tight means that you've engaged the little washer in here, and it is little, okay? Now, if you've got lots of line and you wanted to go like this, what you can do is you can actually loop it 
<laughs> in some cases like this and then add a twist tie to it keep it out of the way okay I'm not gonna worry about that for now I think in this particular situation I'm more likely to go out and get the different shutoff valves later but I'm gonna deal with it for now because well it ain't no big deal to change the shutoff valve there we go so see that I can, I can kind of twist everything out of the way I can put a twist tie on that if I need to to get it out of the way no big deal for now okay but right now we're gonna deal with this remember when we did the drain we said we're not gonna glue that this is why next step is the drain assembly now you'll see this it's the same thing everything has a nut and a washer right here we go this is all for down here this is all to be assembled after the fact and this is how it works this goes in the bottom of the sink like that this is a Teflon ring that goes in between the metal and the rubber because these these the thread on the pipe is not level it's on an angle and so when you put all this together when you're tightening this up really hard you'll have one point of contact that has the most pressure and that's reduced on both sides okay it's on an angle and if I just go without that Teflon right up against the rubber what happens it'll grab it and it'll go and it'll pinch and then you'll have a leak so this is just to help make sure that there's no no grab it's so slippery that you can put an incredible amount of tension that even though it's on an angle it'll be tight all the way around okay and it won't kink on you so make sure you put that assembly properly one then two then three all right um, one of the reasons I love Rebel Pro is because they always have a gasket on their drains you don't have to make your own out of plumbers buddy okay this is set up for a typical sink that has an overflow on it right so that the the drain is the drain is going to connect it about this level and there's a huge gap here for the overflow in the sink to to operate you drop that in place and the plumbing up top is finished <laughs> and we'll just slide all three of these components on until we get to the brass ring and then we just crank it over there Now, I've already got a good seal here, but it's still wiggling around, right? That's what I was talking about, that whole one point of contact. So I'm going to just use my crescent wrench. You bugger. It's not going to get big enough? Seriously? <sighs> Stupid. All right. Sorry, Crescent. I can't give you compliments on that wrench. All right, I'm going to just take my little wrench here and we're going to just work this around a little bit. You can see how it's real like almost closed here, but bigger here on the gap on this side. We're just going to keep on doing this until we have solid contact all the way around. Okay, now my gasket's got solid contact with both sides of the sink. I know I'm going to be good. For our plumbing, we have an ABS system here. Okay, here's our P-trap. It's standard for a sink because it has a drain on it. Okay, so if you ever lose a ring or something, you can just open the drain, put a bucket underneath to grab it, and you can drain it all out. Okay, and it has this release as well. Now, it sits in here like this. If you ever get leaks where you get rotted out stem here on your old sink, uh, if you get hair clogs, it'll cause the metal to rust out real prematurely. You can actually disconnect and then just get a new p-trap and then reconnect it okay just a little something there to help people out all right wrap the threads again plumbing on plumbing plastic on plastic you run the risk okay of a bad joint and so this is less of a, a lubrication and this more of a sealant take the time to add it okay we're going straight front and back, so we'll set it up like that. Really lightly at this point, okay? There's nothing worse than when you do new plumbing to have a customer call you back. I was in that warranty department for that renovation company for a while. Couldn't believe how many times you get warranty for plumbing. Plumbing, plumbing, plumbing. I think the plumber they were using was just 
really big contract company. They're always just cutting corners to get things done because they only gave a 30-day warranty. <laughs> of course, the renovation company had a two-year warranty, so we did nothing but plumbing repairs all the time. All right, now, when I, I'm gonna check the back here where that pipe is. You see the height that that's sitting at? Okay, if I bring that out and I add this right now, I'm still too low. So now we're just gonna walk through real quick the assembly that you're gonna need to connect these drains. If you do it in the right order, it makes it really simple. First thing you wanna do, put your, your P-trap here. Okay, where the bottom is. And imagine this is glued to the very bottom of it. All right. If I go like this, because I want to have this stem somewhere in closer to the bottom here, okay? I don't want to have it just barely making contact with the top. If I go where I want it, the back of the P-trap is higher than the drain, okay? It's higher than that connection. So now I know that I'm going to have a piece of pipe added in here. And the only way that we can measure that is really simple. We'll just start from the front and we'll work our way to the back. This has a washer ring, okay? And then this part threads over top and creates compression. And when it's loose, it can't grab the pipe, okay? But when you tighten it on, it creates a really good seal. So it's not moving. That is what we want. So we're gonna rough to mate here. I'm just gonna use the existing pipe, stick it in the back, dry fit, no glue. And I'm going to go, I would like this seal up here somewhere. This is really nice for me. So now I'm going to measure down to my, and I'm going to cut the pipe that goes about three quarters of the way inside each fitting. Okay, so we'll go like this. And I think three and a half is plenty. Okay. And you know me when I'm measuring pipe, I always go on the printed side. Three and a half is at the U to the D on there we go okay remember this fitting this pipe cutter here the melt the joined line here this here that's my that's where it's going to cut so i put it right on that u to the d and then i stab it and then i twist it i get a perfect cut nice and clean okay so that gives me that assembly and now we'll take this out of the wall get rid of this temporary loosen this off now we're going to glue all of this together Okay. Uh, oy. So you want to glue the fitting and the pipe. And I'll tell you why. We use the word glue here, but this is a solvent. So basically it's melting the two pieces right now. And when I stick them together, then they will, when the solvent stops acting and reacting, it takes about 30 seconds. It'll just be an instant sealed bond. Okay. And it's guaranteed never to leak. As long as you're working with everything clean and new and you put the solvent on both pieces. I know lots of guys out there who only put solvent on one side. There we go. A little bit of a twist just to make sure everything's activated. Good to go. Now that's ready. Okay. Now, now we can put this back on. Okay. And now we can measure from inside the back fitting right from there okay up to this point right here okay about about three quarters again all right now this is going to get a little awkward <laughs> and the fitting to there is four and a half all right let's see if maybe that'll work well that one's five that's just too close to be able to do that four and a half just to the D, line it up, stab and twist. Now the reason I didn't cut it on that piece is I'm only taking a half an inch off. And it's really hard for this thing to do a good job with half an inch, okay. just experience. So that's why I grabbed a new piece. Okay, now this is where this gets interesting because we're going to glue this fitting, that fitting, both ends of this pipe at the same time and connect it all. And the way we do that is you just loosen this collar up a little bit, okay? So there's flexibility. All right, here we go. Okay, I'm gonna start in the back. Give that a run, give this a run. Get a little more. Both ends of the pipe. Oh, got my finger, that's nasty. 
Okay, and we're going to stick it in here. And then I'm going to go like this. I'm going to lift it up into position exactly where I want it. And then I'm going to just give it a bit of a lift. And then I'm going to twist this tight. Now I'm going to tighten this collar. Hand tight again, okay? Don't want to go grabbing a wrench or anything. Remember what I said, if you put too much torque on a plastic thread, you cause it to go from round to oval, and that's when they leak. Here we go. Whew. So now that I have the drain connected, I'm gonna open up my cold water line. I have no idea of knowing if the taps are open or closed at this point. And good for them, they shipped it closed. Now, I can just... Okay, so now we know. These taps are going to get installed that way. Okay, and then to turn them on, you can move forward. There's going to be a lot of water in this. All right. Now there's two stages to testing your drain assembly. One is just running cold water, all right, by itself with the sink open. And you just go both 30 seconds, get a good flow going. Basically what we're doing is we're filling up the P-trap, causing water, and if there's any gaps or leaks, the water will work its way through all the cracks and then it'll start to drip. So this can take a couple of minutes, all right? And that'll test this joint, this joint, the glue joints here, all right? But it won't test the collar because this is higher than the rest of the drain. So, okay, the way you test the collar is you have to fill the sink up with water, all right? So I plug the sink, and then once your sink is full, then you can just unplug it, and it'll be such a large volume of water right away. If this is not tight, then it'll then it'll leak. Oh, and that's just running really smooth. Now, when you're doing your own plumbing at home, the amount of time I just did the leak test is no good. It's not acceptable for ABS plumbing, okay? Because we have threaded fittings and compressions. What I suggest is leave the cold water running on this bad boy, grab a couple paper towels, stick it underneath, and if anything drips, it'll show up real easy. Let it go 10 or 15 minutes, all right? Give it a good test. Because if there's just a little hairline where the water can work through, it can take quite a while before it shows up. And in most cases, a little leak like that, well, you just gotta give it a little bit of a, little bit of a twist to tighten it up, okay? Or it'll seal itself just because of all the <laughs> debris in the water supply system. Okay, well, there we go. That's done. Now let's finish off the handles up top. All right, I'm going to show you a little secret here. Watch this handle. That's where you want it, right down near the bottom, okay? This one, it's not going all the way down. It's because I haven't adjusted the set screw in here yet. Now I've got my precision tool kit here. I know that it's a two and a half millimeter. Or is it? There it is. You have to open the set screw up until you can see the blue, until you see that blue there, okay? And that's like a thread sealer. And then you know, now it drops all the way down, okay? And then you stick your precision tool in there and you tighten up that thread once you have it in place. <clears throat> okay, now this handle is just a little bit off. I want it here. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back underneath the sink. I'm going to use the long drill bit. I'm going to loosen those two screws, and I'm going to turn the tower just a little bit here and then tighten them up again. That'll square it all off. <laughs> That's exactly where I want it. And then tighten them back up again. And that is why it's made that way. Okay, so you can have it perfect every time. All right, whew, there we go. Only thing left, of course, if you found the package and you didn't throw it out, <laughs> decorative caps. Okay, and they just slide in underneath. And it goes in like this, guys. No, it's just like under compression, right? Now, if you need to get access to this handle in the future, you grab your Ulfa knife, okay, you get underneath here, and you can go like this, 
and just pry it out of there. Okay, there we go. Ta-da, now you just gotta do that twice. Hey guys, in this video, we're gonna deal with how to finish off your renovations, specifically in a bathroom. Um, we should have enough skill sets by the time I'm done this video that you can hang just about anything or install just about anything anywhere in your house. We're gonna deal with some electricals, some GFI, some plugs, light fixtures, we're gonna deal with mirrors, we're gonna deal with faucets, we're gonna deal with anything you have to attach to the wall, really, okay? So we're gonna have a bunch of different processes. We're going through drywall, we're going through tile. We're gonna do just about everything you could ever need to do. We're gonna show you how to use the basic hand tools to get all this done, all right? And then you can be competent and install anything moving forward. This should be a lot of help. It'll be pretty condensed. Hopefully, you can learn something new for the first time here. So let's just jump right in this. Um, generally speaking, I like to work from the top down, which means lighting. And that is easy because if I do the lighting, then I can turn the lights on, all right? So, because we have the camera here today, we have artificial lighting, we have our own lights. I'm not gonna worry too much about that. So I'm gonna install one of these light fixtures. And I'm also going to install a mirror. And I'm gonna use a laser line for this, okay? Because we are looking for perfection here. Whenever you're doing a project, you wanna use the center of your faucet to be exactly the distance, middle distance between your light fixtures, all these kinds of things. You really wanna think end from the beginning, frame everything, put your boxes in with the end goal in mind, okay? So right now we've got this all set up so it's double sink, two oval mirrors, and the gap between the light fixture and each mirror edge is exactly the same on all along this wall. So I think we're gonna get a great finish. This is my center line. I've lined it up on the sink here. And what we're gonna do is, well, what's easier for the camera? I'll get on this side of the line, how's that? So I've already measured this off to be exactly center between the two light boxes, and it's right on my tap, which is what it should have been. Um, if you're not sure how I came to that conclusion, you can watch the previous video on how to go from a single to a double sink, okay? I'm pretty sure we cover all the information about how to line up your boxes. I'm gonna put a reference mark here, just in case I end up kicking the light as I go along. Okay, so this is our mirror. It's a nice oval, see? That's why I put that pencil line there. I'm gonna wanna have that for reference, so we will put that back and straddle that, okay. What I'm doing now is I'm just gonna go and look for what looks the best, right? I don't need to see the ceiling, and I'm 5'10 um, and a half, 5'11 in my dad's shoes, right? So I'm gonna bring it down just a bit. This is good. My thumbs are actually about two inches below where the, the electrical box is. I like that, I can see everything I'm wearing. I can see right to the countertop. I think that's gonna work out well. So, we're gonna keep that in mind. And we're gonna take a look at the light fixture. That hole mounts right in the middle of the box. And the light centers a little bit below this. So, that means the center line in this mirror should be about an inch and a half below the box. So that's a good spot, right? Okay, now, what I can do with my laser is I can raise this bad boy up. And the reason I love to use this is because I'm doing more than one mirror. If you're only doing one mirror, you can do all kinds of cheating here. But so when you're doing two, you gotta have a system that you can duplicate. Because you can see the hooks on the back here. These are designed to put in two screw plugs in the wall and you hang it on the screw. It's not a lot of mercy here, so you gotta get this pretty dead on. Now, there's my laser line, about two inches below the box. We're gonna call that the center, okay? So now I'm gonna find the center of my mirror, about there, okay? I'm gonna put a line. All right, here we go. From that line, I'm gonna go nine inches. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure up nine inches from here. This is gonna be the height of my hooks. And this is my center line, right? Here we go, and my hooks, my screw heads, are gonna be seven and three quarter inches apart. Well, that's just brilliant. So let's change this again. Bathrooms are always so much fun because there's never enough room in here to really function. <laughs> Okay, seven and five eighths, if you're not good with math, you take your seven and five eighths and you just fold your tape over, okay? And then you can read right there. It's three and seven eighths, okay? 
So I'm going to put three and seven eighths on my red line, make a mark, seven and five eighths, make my other mark. There we go. Now all I got to do is make sure that that line is level. And I don't need a laser for that. There we go. There and there. Now the only other thing you need to know now is if there's a stud there. And if we don't have a stud, then we know we need a wall plug. So you put your stud finder flat against the wall, and then you press the button. And when it says it's ready, which is the green light, you start sliding. There's a stud there. So I'm right on the edge of a stud. That's going to be tricky. And Wow. I have another stud here. Very unique. Huh. So, whether it's a stud or some other obstruction, I'm not exactly sure. I know my plumbing is in the center of the wall and it's horizontal here for the vents. And I'm not sure what's going on there. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an exploratory hole with, I'm going to use my, my Robertson bit. This is a safe way to check. There's nothing here that's sharp enough to penetrate a plumbing line or electrical line and do damage. So since we're not sure, we're just going to start like this. Yeah, I'm right off the edge. Okay? And then this, if I'm putting in a screw there, it's going to go and it's going to be very, very unique. Here, I actually have stud. In this case, I don't need wall plugs. What I do need to do is just put a plug here and leave about uh, 3 sixteenths of space between the head of that screw and the wall so that that hook can go on. And over here, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to drill in an angle so I get positive contact with that stud. And the goal is to have that screw head line up where I want it when I'm done. Bam. Loving that. All right. Now, there are two ways to mount these mirrors, right? You can take an airline wire and you can buy a little mirror hanging kit at the store and you wrap it around each end and then you only put one screw in the middle and you can set your mirror on and you can level it off and that works great. But when you have two, you can't do that because they'll never be level. <laughs> so this is why we've got to do it the old fashioned hard way. What you want to do is get your fingers on here. If it's stiff enough, you can set them like that and forget it. Great. Stand to the side. Just line them up. There we go. Boom. <laughs> but that's going to work great. But the, se the secret here is taking this information and transferring it over there. So what we have to do before we move forward, okay, is get this horizontal line on again. And we want to take this information and we were nine inches above. Yes. And I want to come over here off the center mark. I want to mark my nine inches above. Okay. And then I'm going to want to bring my laser level over off the center hole. Mark this, get a center line, measure both directions again and do the same thing. Okay. Now let's move on to the light fixture. I already know because this is my house and I wired this that the power goes to that box, then that box, then over here. So I'm starting at the end. I'll work my way back over there. And when I'm doing the, the first light in this series, I'll double check, make sure the switch is off so I don't have any power in it. Right now I don't know, but because it's not connected, I know there's no power in this. So just as a precursor, so you know I'm not working crazy with the power on. Not that that makes me nervous, but for today's video, we'll assume I'm sane. All right, here we go. This particular fixture comes with a few elements. Always open up your packaging before you go install. You'll never find light bulbs in a light fixture box in most cases. Okay, so we've got a lens. We've got the mount with the wiring and we've got a mounting bracket. Okay, and then this little ring here is what's used to tie all these together. And once it's connected, then you add the bulb afterwards. So, so let's just go through the process. First of all, we're going to need a Robertson screw bit, which we have because these screws are the mounting screws for this plate. And what we want to do is bring the wire through the middle. 
nice and easy. And there we go. And because we're mounting through the middle off of this bracket, anywhere where we can set this where it's going to install easily, if we're going to go with. Okay, you don't have to go with one of the little holes. You can use one of the big ones and adjust it over time. Doesn't really matter. These brackets are designed to be incredibly functional and, and actually incredibly versatile. You can even mount this round box on an old rectangular box and turn that into a light if you, get, if you need to. All right? Because it has all these different options for mounting. Here we go. So I got my neutral, I got my power, and I got my ground. And for good measure, we're going to back out the ground screw. And then tighten it on. If you wire clockwise and you tighten clockwise, everything tightens when you use the drill. If you put it on the wrong side, it'll all just fire right out of it, okay? You're gonna run into all kinds of trouble. Look at this. This is cute, eh? Like I was saying earlier, you don't wanna be doing all your fixtures and stuff until your paint has been drying for a couple of days. It needs to harden. Every time something bumps into it, it'll make a dent or a scratch or mark, and you can't wash it off. Remember, you can't wash your washable paint on your walls until 30 days after you paint, because that's how long it takes it to cure before you can wash it. Oh, geez, careful, Jeff, careful. Here we go. So you can see how I'm wrapping it around that wire a lot. I'm trying to guarantee positive contact long term after this install is over. Hey, that's enough of that there, boy. All right, here we go. Now. I'm going to take this wire and I'm going to uh, do that as well. I know this is overkill because these screws make this plate grounded to the box, but you know, going a little overkill isn't going to hurt anybody in this situation. Now, you really want to figure out where your wires are going to go here. Okay. And you want to kind of connect everything around free from obstruction. And this is only a quarter inch thick, and I've got almost an inch of this threaded rod sticking out, so we're gonna tighten it back up. And I'm gonna stick this on. Why is that only going in? There we go. I almost cross-threaded that, Max. That would've really sucked. Okay. So I have another problem here that I'm going to have to deal with now. Can you imagine? Can you guess? Anybody guess in the comment section? <clears throat> That's right. I used a pan box. And for whatever reason, they decided to give us a three inch bolt <laughs> for mounting this box. Like that's just, The bolt needs to be an inch long here. Looks like it's making contact with the ground wire in there. Let's move that out of the way. There we go. Now we should be able to get enough of that thread it in there to make enough room. All right. Sometimes the thickness of the ground wire is all that it takes. Eh? I'm liking my odds here. Yes, sir. That was it. Now we're going to polish this up. This is a great time to check for stickers, by the way. The sticker is actually on the ring. Sometimes it's on the light fixture. And it'll have a sticker telling you information about the light bulbs you can use. You want to remove that sticker as soon as possible. In the old days, we used to have incandescent light bulbs and got really warm. And those stickers would always leave a nasty residue if you turn the lights on before removing them. Electricians are famous for not removing stickers off a of light fixture, so be careful about that. All right, as it turns out, I bought some LED light fixtures, light bulbs. Holy crap, are these ever huge? <laughs> well, that's a lot of bulb. <laughs> Just wanted 60 watts. I didn't realize I had to get something as big as my car. There we go. That's the light fixture installed. Yay. Um, I would show you at work, but we'll show you in the end of the video. Okay, we'll, we'll make sure that we do an after shot of the whole room so you get the whole idea. 
here we go onto the next fixture we don't want to waste any of your time so regular wall plug uh, we got a lot of wire here okay I'm gonna grab the end and all you do is turn it it creates a nice hook okay it's easy to work with this okay you set it on one side of that box and you can pinch the wire shut and then you just tighten it on okay piece of cake now generally on almost every fixture you get the screws on the side with the ground are always the whites all right and brass and black okay white and the silver so the way you remember this is the brass and the black go together. I think I did a video of this before and I got that wiring combination screwed up. It wasn't always incredibly comfortable on camera. My brains would scramble. Here we go. So we're gonna have, this is part of a circuit. So this power's coming in and going out, all right? So generally what I like to do is do the whites first, okay? Again, you pinch the end and you curl a hook into it. All right, now I am not a master electrician by any stretch, but let's just be honest. You don't need to have a master electrician to wire a receptacle any more than you need an engineer to drive a car down the street. This stuff is not that tricky. And anybody who's doing their wiring, wrapping the wire around the screws is already miles ahead as far as integrity is concerned because on the back they have these little holes push and play like you can just push the wire in there i'm telling you right now if you want to do a nice wiring job at your house don't use those holes yes they're convenient well wow, that's really long yes the holes are convenient but they are known to fail get a loose connection and then you can't ever pull them back out. You have to cut them off, which means you have a live piece of wire sticking out of the back when you go in the box next time. And you increase the risk of problems and starting fires and all that business. Just put a wire on a screw, all right? <clears throat> and stop being lazy. If you spend your whole career and you stop one fire from happening as an electrician because you do this versus the plug and play, it was worth the time you took, okay? Let's do this. Um, talk to me. Are you the, uh, oh my God, <laughs> light upside down? Or are you more like this kind of look? Which do you prefer? <laughs> I like to make them look like a face. For whatever reason, the, uh, the human brain recognizes that and it finds it more aesthetically pleasing. If you think I'm wrong, let me know, but I've had long conversations with people about this before. There is no actual right way and wrong way here. All right. And the secret is you push it to the wall and then you tighten it up. Okay. Don't over tighten because you'll push this too far inside and then the wall plate won't cover nice. Speaking of wall plates, if you do a decent job with your drywall, and you won't need to use oversized plates. You can get the normal size. If, however, you have too big of a hole because of your remodel, okay, you don't like that. You can always push them around just a little bit. There we go. Got to love a good orphan knife. As long as you got a knife on you, you never need a screwdriver. And again, these screws go vertical. Okay, aesthetically pleasing. Okay, now we can jump on to the faucet. Before we do, we'll talk real quick about the GFI. All right, okay. GFI, all right, they have a few different versions out here. The idea is um, if something horrible goes wrong, it turns itself off. That's all you need to know as a homeowner. On the back, again, you got brass and you got silver. You got a ground screw and you have this little taped on section, okay? If you're only bringing a single pair of wires, a black and a white, you wire it right here. And if you want the circuit to continue from here, you remove the yellow tape and you put the black and the white here. And that carries on to the next fixture. Wow. That was complicated, huh? <laughs> Listen, the technology is all in the switch. You don't have to know anything different. Um, that plug down there cost $1.95, and this one cost $28. You've got to trust the technology. Don't wire it backwards, or you most likely will kill it, and then you have to spend another 30 bucks for a new one. They're a little bit sensitive. Let's just set these wires up. Now, this is... Contrary to common sense, this one's actually live. Uh, 
I'm just not in the mood to go downstairs and do this right now. We are going to wire the whole switch right up to the last live wire, and we'll do that one at the end, all right? Again, we'll do the ground first. Oh, neat. All right, my bad. These don't need hooks. See that, Max? These have got a, um, a big brass plate. And the screw released makes hold to slide the, the wire straight in. Cut them all back again. And we're just going to go with whatever the recommended dis distance is for this. Nice. Not too long. You don't want to have exposed wires sticking out of the back of the box. Well, this is actually going to be a lot more entertaining than I thought. So you have to hold it upside down in order to release the plate. Okay, and then you can turn it over, tighten the screw. Good. Now we're going to do the two whites. Now, this is the one with the power, okay? And this is the one where the power comes in. Okay. And we will. Interesting system they got here. All right. Now, both of these screws are all the way through to the other side of the brass. All right. Flip it over. Okay, now it's time for some safety precautions because we're going to deal with a live circuit. I'm going to wrap all of the screws in electrical tape. Okay, perfect. Loving it. And here's the reason why. If you touch a live wire, you don't electrocute yourself because there's no circuit until it connects to the neutral. So if I can't come in contact with the neutral wire, I can't complete the circuit. Loving it, eh? So now we're going to take the live power off and we're going to cut it back a little bit because it's a little long. We're going to treat it with a healthy amount of respect here. If anything goes wrong here, it's on me. <laughs> so what I want to do is get rid of this. I'm going to open that gate up. Okay. I'm holding the tab at the end because these two are always safe, even in a live situation. Okay. Good. All right. Now, let's hit the reset button and the little light should turn on. Oh, I guess the power wasn't on after all. Right on. Okay, I'll have to go down and turn the brake around. Always better to treat it like the power's on. And then you'll never have to worry about someone like, let's say uh, one of your sons going downstairs, and they go downstairs and they go, oh, that one's not working, that must be mine. Yeah, that happens. <laughs> so, the other thing you can do is have a little proximity tester, a little green stick on you or something. All right. So I just threw my laser level on the, the mouth of that plug. And it's on the mouth of that plug. So the boxers are perfectly level. What we have here is going to be really common. This countertop is not installed level. There's a nasty slope. It comes with these beautiful big feet on it that didn't give us the ability to level it off to perfection. What we have is flat, stable, and pretty darn level. As a result, this plug is a quarter inch lower towards the countertop than this side, and I have a stone backsplash. So, although it looks great, it's going to be an issue as soon as I put the back on. So, what I've got to do, got to raise this bad boy up, because I need four inches of clearance. Right now, I only have three and seven eighths. Okay? So, now I get to show you how to fix this. As a DIY renovator, you're going to want to follow a lot of these little tips, little systems that I use, okay? Here's one of my systems that I use. When I mount my boxes, 
I mount my boxes with one screw on a 45 degree angle from the middle going into the second hole. All right, here's why. Look at the size of this cover plate. Okay, right? I've got almost a half an inch of Mercy here that I can play with. So, let's dig right in here, Max. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut out drywall so that I can raise the box. Now, this particular box has got the set screws on the inside of the box, which is brilliant. So when you're shopping, you got choices. The boxes come with the set screw on the inside, or there's a little flange on the top and the bottom. Whatever you do, make sure you always set it so that you can maneuver it to a new height. Okay, now, up we go. Right on. Okay. Again, let's get the mouth working. Let's pre-bend the wires so they collapse properly. Again, finish vertical. Now, listen, this is kind of like best case scenario. Everything's brand new. Everything's already flat and level. You know, using a laser level works. But as soon as you have to start modifying things to fit a space, like we did with the vanity. And you can watch that in the other video that we did about how to go from single to double vanity. Really, this should not be that difficult for a screw, right? Eh? Okay, here we go. <laughs> then you'll appreciate the amount of effort and energy that goes into making this look good. I'm only off half a degree, maybe one degree tops, over six feet. And that eighth of an inch is the difference between me doing what? Cutting the plate? What's the other option here? Cut the stone I'm about to stick on? No, the option is lift this up and make it look like it's set at the same height. It's not gonna be the end of the world. It's still gonna look perfect when you walk in and nobody's gonna walk into your bathroom with a laser love and go, aha, you're out of a sixteenth of an inch. So there we go, problem solved. Listen, because we have lots of room, we're gonna do the backsplash. Um, then I'm going to add the silicone seal and then I'm gonna put the faucets in. Uh, why the heck not, right? Let's just make life difficult for me. Work top down and back front. Um, I would suggest usually in most cases putting the faucet first, but I'm down for a challenge today. So I'm gonna go get the backsplash and I'm gonna teach you how to mount this. And no, you can't just use anything. You gotta use the right stuff. So let's just do a test on this first. See how it looks. That's upside down. We really don't wanna start in the wrong direction. There's a polished and an unpolished edge here. This is natural stone. I think it's quartz. Look at that. That's pretty darn awesome. You can tell gravity does most of the work here, right? When you go to install some, anything that's a stone, follow the same procedure like as if it's natural stone. If you treat everything like marble, you'll never make a mistake. Marble is porous. Different products have different porosity. And you can attach things with white silicone, black silicone, clear silicone, PL premium. But sometimes the wrong combination of those adhesives will cause you to see the adhesive staying through the stone. And you'll end up with a big squiggly line. And then who's gonna look like an idiot, eh? So, might I suggest the best process here is to just lay it down. And you don't even have to get too close to the edge. Okay, gravity's gonna do most of the work here. All right, and we're going to just slide it into place. There you go. So, I don't even know if I'm happy with that. I'm, I might have to take this off and just raise it up another quarter inch to get a bit of a gap. Resist the temptation to press it into the wall. Most walls have got a bit of a bend and a wave to it, okay? Come back with your clear silicone and just throw the tiniest little bead right against the top. And if the hole opens up, just make it a wider bead. 
The reason we're using clear is because it's a pre-painted surface. Okay, and you'll see the paint through the, the silicone after it dries. And you won't really be able to tell of the gap. Now, don't use just transparent. The transparent stuff gets a little cloudy white. And it never looks as nice. But the clear always comes out looking more like a window, like a piece of glass. All right. And when you do this, you want to have the side of the finger pressed against the wall so that if it squeezes anywhere, it squeezes onto and behind the stone. Okay, you see the gaps? Unacceptable. Always managing your silicone and your drips, all right? Get a bigger hole and then open up the, the hole that wide and then just do a second pull, close that gap. If you fill it properly, you won't get those shadows and stuff from the product not making contact with the back of the stone and behind it. I know that looks a little funny right now, but let it dry and it almost totally disappears. That's how you fix an imperfect world. Clear silicone. Do not touch that again. <laughs> Once you put silicone somewhere, do not work above it for at least 24 hours, all right? Or 12. Like, don't be nuts, but at least 12. Now, we're also going to want to put a little bead right down here to prevent water from getting in between the backsplash and the countertop. And this is just a thin bead, nice and easy. Always managing the tip of that silicone. This is where having the faucet here first is difficult. I'm trying to manage that. Look at all the difficulty I'm having here. Turn your water on. Use your finger to drive it. Okay. There we go. Now we're going to move on to the other faucet. In case you didn't see me install the faucet on the going from one to two vanity video. Okay, we're going to do the quick version of this. For the extended version, you can watch the video where we went from not one vanity to two, but one sink to two sinks. We changed the plumbing, we opened the wall, we did everything, rerouted it, all right? So it's worth a watch because one of the ways you can increase the value of your home is if you have a single vanity in your master bath, change it to a double his and hers, right? Easy money. Okay, so here we go. I just tried to remove what I saw was a foreign obstacle in the drain. It turned out to be a piece of that broken glass from that damn light I wanted to show you. So I reached down and pushed it with my finger and guess what? It didn't move, but the finger did. That really sucked. And there we go. I just saved $1,500 in hospital bills. Okay. <laughs> just joking. I don't have to pay for mine up here, and I didn't want to rub it in. Here we go. Here's our faucet assemblies, right? All right. When you're dealing with these widespread faucets, there's always multiple parts. Make sure you consult with the uh, installation instructions. But for the most part, you're going to have something like this. You back up the bottom plate, so now you have something nice and tight. And the handle goes on and it makes something pretty with an eighth of an inch there, so there's no, no rubbage when you're opening and turning it, okay? Piece of cake, and then we can thread on a washer from underneath. They're marked hot and cold. All right, and then we have the faucet line, which has got something similar going on. Right here like that. There's no way to connect that and hold it in place until afterwards, yay. This is the drain, comes with a gasket for up top. It's also threaded here, okay? Here is a place, I think I forgot to do that on the other video, Max. Anything that's threaded should have a joint compound, okay? And it can be as simple as something like this. Been in that box, man, for months. But look at that, comes out like brand new, okay? Nothing too serious. Go backwards until it sits in the cradle there, off we go to the races. Okay, that's just to make sure that nothing leaks down the road. Um, you can buy different tail pieces, that's why it comes like that. All right, so we're different functions, so whatever. Is what it is, we just drop that in the hole, and everything else we connect from underneath. Here's the, uh, the, the short and skinny on it. Okay, so you drop that in, and then from underneath you put this other gasket on, this way. 
okay? There's a hole in the sink that you want that wedge to fill. And it goes under compression by using a slip ring and that, and then you tighten it all up, okay? Now, if you want to watch the whole palming assembly, we've got it in the video for how to go from a single to a double sink. I suggest you watch it. It's very detailed and step-by-step. -step. But just so you know, plumbing is pretty basic. Every time you buy a plumbing fixture, it comes with instructions. All right? And if you like these particular faucets, they're very affordable. Rehabel Pro, put information in the video description so you can find out where to get it where you live. The good thing is, is the faucet part here, okay? It's a push connect. All right, and so the water supply, hot and cold, go into the bottom here underneath the sink, and then you just push connect the top in. All right, it's about as simple a plumbing as you're gonna find in the market, and this stuff works phenomenal. Let's just get it on. Make sure your handles go in horizontal so you turn towards you. That's why they're marked hot and cold, because they operate in the opposite function. So make sure you put the hot on the right side. And there's this lovely little set screws in here for the handles. Okay, this little piece of packaging that looks like garbage, keep it. <laughs> Don't throw that out. All right, there we go. There's the skinny. Woohoo! Okay, now remember I showed you how to draw the lines over here for the other mirror. I wanted to just put this one in because, um, real quick, we, I got weirdly lucky with studs and framing in the wall. This one, not so lucky. I'm, I miss it by half an inch. And this one, there's nothing here. Okay, so. In this case, I'm just gonna take my Phillips bit, all right? I'm gonna put it right where the hole is. That's it. Okay, I'm gonna punch a couple of holes in here. I'm gonna show you, I get these at Home Depot, okay? These are actually one of the best wall drywall anchors out there. Now, if you haven't seen it, we do a video. We're kind of making fun of drywall anchors because most of them don't work with their darn, all right? These actually do. You collapse the middle and you push the points over, all right? You stick them in that hole. <clears throat> and generally speaking, they're bigger than your drill bit. Take your hammer and sink them in nice and flush. They have that star grid on the backside. It cuts the drywall, okay, so they won't twist. So feel free to give them a good shot, all right? And then inside the package, they have this little red plunger. Okay, and it's skinny, 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 and then it gets thick. And you want to put that plunger in there and push it until the thick part goes all the way to the back. Maybe I'll just show you what happens to it. And what happens is it pushes the back out. Okay. And then when you put in the screw, the screw goes all the way through the back and then pulls it nice and tight and creates this crazy wedge. All right. That is a really good system, and I love it. <coughs> it's harder than you think sometimes. There we go. All right, it takes a lot of force. There we go. Now, these are Robertsons, imagine that. Wasn't expecting that to be a Canadian product. And then at the same time, I shouldn't be surprised that the best plug system that I like is a Canadian product. All right. Okay, one more quick time. I haven't even checked to see, but because it's a Robertson screw and I'm thinking it's a Canadian product, I'm gonna check to see if this is available on Amazon. If it is, I'll put it in the video description down below. Not too many <laughs> Robertson screw fixture products available in the States. Wow, the back of this mirror is crazy sharp. Whew. I almost wanna wear gloves touching this thing. What happens when you purchase stuff? Actually, these weren't even on Amazon. My wife went and bought these at the store. There we go. Okay. All right. Another reason to buy an Olfa knife right there. Makes your finger really long. Piece of cake, right? Ah, she's coming together. <laughs> well, that was a lot of video. Um, I'm going to suggest that if you're watching these A to Z videos from here moving forward, really suggest maybe you find a way to watch on a really big TV. We're filming this stuff in 4K ultra high definition right now, which is blow your socks off kind of film quality. So if you're in a place where you've got a good internet connection and you can watch this on a 4K TV, you're gonna get to see different angles and nuances that you aren't gonna pick up if you're watching on your phone, okay? That's just the bottom line. 
for best viewing experience, you should check this out on your television. Just go to your smart television and it'll be amazing. Now, wanted to encourage you guys, subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet, so you get the bell for notifications checked off. The next video coming up is going to be the shower A to Z, and we did a complete remodel, tile over tile in that one. All brand new products that you can get at your local Home Depot to solve the supply chain issues that we're having with everything else in the market. And if you're interested in what we're doing here in this 1880 farmhouse, click the link over here and join this from the very beginning. We've got videos on how we transform this entire home. The only thing we saved was the framing. Everything else in here is brand new. Hope you enjoy it and you learned a lot. You can do this yourself. You can DIY it and you can make a fortune too, just like me. Cheers.